Hey everybody, how are we doing this morning? It's Friday, good morning. Let's wake up here to some, you know, like, punch out. I love some punch out music. But speaking of video games, did anybody see the PlayStation kind of like upcoming games yesterday? Did anybody see that? Besides me. Am I like the only person who saw the new PlayStation games? Surely one person in chat saw it. Saw some of these new upcoming games and I didn't think I was gonna get a PlayStation 5. I know, it does look, <laughs> the console does look pretty crazy. I love all the like the trapper keepers and stuff. But man, I tell you, the new Spider-Man, the Spider-Man Miles Morales, holy mackerel. Like that, like, it's coming out holiday 2020, and that's the release of the console. I think that just sold me a PlayStation 5. Like, I thought the, oh man, I still haven't played the new Spider-Man, but then like, it looks so good. And did they show the new, new Assassin's Creed? I gotta check that out if so. And then there's the new Horizon Zero Dawn. That Stray game looks interesting. You've got so many games coming out. Looks like they're keeping that controller. What's up? Good morning, Connor. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. And all the um, oh, Rockstar with the uh, with the uh, with the um, Grand Theft Auto Five, right? I know Spider Man PS Four. See, so that's the thing though. Is I think I'll just buy a PS Five. And can you play PS Four on PS Five? Because if you can, I'll immediately get the first Spider Man. Because I I kind of heard because I started looking into it and I was like, oh, they have the like. They have the uh, origin story of Miles Morales in the first Spider-Man game. So I was like, oh man. So I'll, I'll get the origin story and then like I'll play Miles Morales. And I was like, that's that's super cool. And you can see like all of his powers, like his electricity powers and stuff. And his like invisible power in the preview. <sighs> Looks awesome. I think there's like 5,000 games that will be backwards compatible. Yeah, and I, they got, you know, Spider-Man is an exclusive. And man, those games just look awesome. Yeah, so that looks great. So that's that's what's happening in the world today. That's what's going on. PlayStation Five coming out strong with good, good games, good previews. I mean, there's there's so many exclusives. So I don't know. Maybe I'll get maybe I'll just get a PlayStation Five, or I'll get an Xbox One X. I don't know. Series X. I don't know. I don't know. Like what what exclusives are there on Xbox that I really need? So maybe I'm just getting a PS Five. I don't know. Or maybe I'm getting neither. Who knows? <laughs> okay. Are you ready to start class? Who is ready? Let's do this. So we ended class yesterday. And let me actually, let me show something. And I kept trying to send this after the third attempt. I was like, okay, it's not going to send. I was like, okay, I give up. So did anyone go and check out the flow chart that I sent? And check out the flow chart. Am I here? Am I on the screen? Yeah, I'm here. Good. Did anyone go... Xbox has more uh, GB Game Boys. Did anyone look at the flow chart that I sent right here yesterday, where it's like the no's and the yeses, and does it make sense to you? So I would, it was definitely yeah, good, 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 good. And so that's what I wanted. I wanted um, and sorry, I just like I literally, if you go to the announcements, I think in the first one I actually didn't send it. I was like, oops, because I went over. There's a thing where you can like attach things. I didn't attach it, and I was like, oh, oops. And then I sent the second one. I was like, yay, it's sent. And then I tried attaching it a third one. I was like, okay, good. That was my goal. I sat down and I was like, let me make a graphic that really like walks you through and what's going on. So I was like, because I'm going to keep the homework due tonight. And I was like, okay, this is the only thing we really didn't talk about. I'm going to talk about this today. But let me make a really quick and easy flow chart where you just ask, like, are both variables quantitative? No, then you're not doing correlation. Is it relationship monotonic? If you say yes, then you can continue down. So it has to be monotonic. That's the thing. Like, if it's not monotonic, you got to do something different. You got to do like transformation. You got to do like fit a parabola. So there's, you know, I, I was going to say try something else, but I put try a transformation, which is something you can do. Like, this is where this is a very divergent road. And then from here, really, uh, Pearson's correlation is what we do in 201. So we'll be talking about this more in a moment, but Pearson's correlation is for like, Linear, which linear is a subtype of monotonic because linear has to go up or down. So this is like monotonic, it's in one direction. So it can be monotonic non-linear, but if it's monotonic, I mean, excuse me, if it's linear, it has to be monotonic. And we have here, does it have no outliers? And these should all be yes. So I, I originally wrote outliers and I was like, oh, that'll make it diverge this way if it's Pearson. But I wanted these all to be yes. Like, is it monotonic? Is it linear? Has it, does it have no outliers? Q, Q, straight enough. See, literally, look, QQ, straight enough, no outliers, plot doesn't thicken. 
So for those of you who took my 201, you literally have QQ, straight enough, no outliers, plot doesn't thicken, and there you go. There's Pearson. Right there, Pearson, stat 201, my Pearson, that's where we used to go to. So you might be wondering, what is Spearman? You know what, it's not, it's not bad if we start class by talking about Spearman a little bit here, and say, like, what's up with this Spearman type thing? So Spearman, we don't have to worry about calculating it, but let's let's think about how Spearman is calculated. So this is what is Spearman to start class, and then we'll go back and talk about permutations a little bit more. Um, the way Pearson works is you literally just look at the correlation between X and Y such that if it's like this, it's a one. And if it was, if it was wider, like if it was more like this, if the points were out like here, it'd be closer to a zero. And Pearson only measures the what strength of, um, the correlation. Pearson only measures a certain type of strength. Who knows for 50 points on friday let's go 200 points i'm throwing 50 pointers out though gonna wake you guys up here at the start pearson only measures the what strength of correlation it only looks at this type of strength because something like this which is extremely strong will have zero for its strength this is by pearson's measure i'll take monotonic for 50. it does measure monotonic but it's mainly meant for this like this it's so this will have r equals zero linear you got it you got it got it linear 50 points all is linear is brad you're getting 52 um but it measures linear so something that's non-linear like this right here since this is non-linear it it has an r equal to zero and if you want to do r squared which is on the assignment r squared you just literally take it and do r squared so that's r squared equals zero like the the line explains zero percent of the variation so if you put a line through this that line explains 0% of the variation in Y. Like the variation in X due to the line explains 0% of the variation in Y. Like 0% of the variation in Y is explained by 0%. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Let's wake up here. 0% of the variation in Y is explained by the variation in X. That's how you say it right there. And we'd put the names of X and Y in there, but we're just doing X and Y for now. Um, where this one right here, if this has an R equal to like another 50 point or first person, if this has an R equal to 0 0.9, what is the R squared here? What is the R squared of this line? If you put a line through this and it has an, so what is the R squared of that one? Yep, Mila, another 50, excellent work. Yep, and then 81% of the variation in Y is explained by the variation in X. That's it, 50 points everyone else. Keep, wake up here, wake up these mornings, 200 points, you might get them really quick, but wake up, let's get our brains going. So that is Pearson. So the point of Pearson is to measure linear. And the way I remember this is like in Stat 201, we go to the site My Pearson. So if you remember like, oh, in 201, I went to My Pearson. And now in 320, we're going to do Spearman. Now, Pearson and Spearman are very different. Spearman. Spearman. Let's look at our chart to cheat and see when Spearman's used. Spearman can handle other things. Spearman's can handle nonlinear. It can handle outliers. And it can handle heteroscedastic. So if you have... And it's like, how big should these issues be? That's where like the, uh, like it's subjectivity because it's like, well, if it's like a little bit nonlinear, it's like how nonlinear is it? How many outliers does it have? How heteroscedastic is it? So the bigger the issues, the more likely you are to use Spearman, but there's no like, I mean, there's obvious things. There's obvious things. Like here, I'll show you an obvious one. This is obvious Spearman. Like this is, if, if someone did, if someone used Pearson here instead of Spearman, I'd be like, are you crazy? Because this is, what's wrong with you? This is very nonlinear. I hate that it zooms out or does that. So there's other ones though, like this right maybe here. Um, That's probably better. I mean, that one's just a few points, but still it's probably a Spearman because of the outliers. Or, or you could have a pretty good relationship right here like this, and they could have a few outliers like that, and I would still use uh, Spearman on that. So Spearman's going to better handle these outliers. So due to the outliers, I would go with Spearman here. So that's where I would do that. And the other one's heteroscedasticity. So there's homoscedasticity or heteroscedasticity. And if you notice, these relationships here are mostly homoscedastic, excuse me, because they have about the same spread. It doesn't really change the thickness. Even the red one I drew, which is weak, um, has about the same thickness across. I guess over there it doesn't, but mm, similar enough. Like it, it doesn't have to be perfect. I want to keep reiterating that, that what we're really looking for is something 
like this right here. Now this is a heteroscedastic. So this is heteroscedastic right here because it has differing strengths, hetero meaning differ and scedastic meaning strength. So this Spearman right here is going to better represent the correlation. So this is Spearman's correlation, sometimes represented by R, oops, not big R, little r sub s. And you might say this has a Spearman um, rank correlation, we're on that in a moment, of 0.7. Now, I just said what it is, it's rank correlation. So let's think about what Spearman rank correlation is by drawing a big graphic right here and drawing a perfect rank correlation. Now, the way rank correlation works is the following. We go to, we'll do this, one, two, three, four. We go to a point, and let's say this starts at zero and this goes to 20. So this will be here, zero, oh, well, I can't draw this morning. <laughs> zero and 20, five, 10, 15, 20, good. And five, 10, 15, 20, good. Okay, so we go here, 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 and here, okay. And this is very important why I drew it this way, because the correlation on this would not be perfect. The correlation on this is going to, it's, it's hard to draw, but the correlation on this is definitely not linear, and because a line doesn't go through it, I can't really draw a line that goes through these points. The correlation is not there for linear correlation. There is a non-linear shape to it. But the Spearman here is actually perfect, because let's pretend that this point here is x1, let's do its x coordinate here with red, and then this one is 9, and this one is 5, 10, 15, cool, 15, this is 17, this is 20, and this is 22. Now we're going to do its y coordinate in green, and when you do its y coordinate, this is maybe y1, y6, y, uh, it's only y, well, it's y7, let's say, and then y, I can't read, 9, and then y15, and then y20. Now what I want you to notice here is, is that the rank of x, like if we put these in order, let's highlight this x. This is what, the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, what is it in terms of, if you were to count up the x's in order, if you put the x's in order, that would be what, the first x you see, the second x you see, the third x you see, that would be the what x. Let's put that in order right here. Like if you put that in order of like the first x, second x, what would that be? I kind of made it pretty obvious in this one. Third, Austin, 50 points right there. That's the third, following along perfectly. So I'm going to erase these numbers that I just put in. Let's do the y because it's going to be easier to erase those. So if you notice right here, actually let's erase them all. Cool. Now I'm going to put in the ranks instead. So this is not the actual numbers. This is the first x. I'm just going across the x-axis this way. Just going across. This is the second x, this is the third, this is the fourth. It doesn't matter what number it is, I'm just putting the order in which they appear. Does that make sense to everybody? I'm just putting the order in which they appear. This is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. I'm just going in the rank. I'm just saying this is the lowest, this is the second lowest. That's all I'm doing. I'm not writing their numbers because their numbers are down here. This is not six, this is like 22. So it's not the number, it's the rank of the x. So now I'm gonna do it to the y. I'm just gonna go up like this I'm not going to put that this is right here like 20. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go up in terms of ranks, and this is going to be the first, the second, the third, because you see I'm just going up, fourth, fifth, and sixth. I'm just going up every time, so the rank is just going up right there of y. And what do you notice? What do you notice between the ranks? They're perfectly what? All you do now is you just do correlation on the ranks. So you would, you would literally just go, and if you did it in like R, like if you had to compute this, you would just go over here. We did so many crazy fun things yesterday, I love it. You'd go right here, and you just do like x is a vector one through six. And this is what the computer's doing for you because you don't have to do it, y is a vector one through six. And we should say, is it core? Maybe it's core. Oh, there it is, yeah. And it's perfect. So I don't usually use correlation, I, I use it outside. Can I do association on it? I might be able to do it. Y tilde X, error plot margin too large. Yeah, looks like I can do the correlation on this without the data frame. Invalid graphic state, really, really? For some reason my R keeps saying that. 
and then I reset R and it works. So that's been confusing me lately. But does this make sense that we have right here? Oh, no associate. Cause library right cause. There we go. And there it is. So this right here is perfect correlation. If you can't see, this is perfect correlation right here. And we actually get a p-value of what looks to be zero. Oh yeah, because we got perfect correlation. So we should get zero for the p-value. That's not the p-value. Ooh, p-value is 0 0.002, which it can happen by random chance. That makes sense. We got some that were as extreme by random chance. We got just a few when we reordered these. Now remember, these weren't the original values of this. The original values were something like um, 1, 5, 8, 15, 20, 21, 22. And then we go right here and we go up slowly on this one. We go like 1, 2, 3, 6, and we only have a few values, 5, 8, 15, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 20, let's go really crazy, 30, 50. Okay, cool. And now we run this again, and we get the following. And this looks pretty similar to what I drew right here. If you remember the drawing I just had over on the side, this looks pretty similar to it. So I was kind of thinking in my head, I had like this big upward bend at the end of it. So now you'll notice that the Pearson is only like point, point 0.8 or so. Does everyone see this red line is your result? These are the big things we need to know. Is that the red line, I'm gonna disappear. The red line right here is your result. The Pearson has doesn't have perfect linear correlation. But when you take the ranks, look at where your Spearman is at. Does everyone see this red line right here is the value of your Spearman correlation. We can look at it in the output too. Now what is for 200 points, and you can add them onto today, what is this dashed red line? Look right here, here's your Pearson, and here's a dashed red line right here. Someone put into words what this dashed red line represents, because here's your actual Pearson, and here's a dashed red line. Here's your actual Spearman, and then right over here is a dashed red line. It's almost like this is your result, and this is a result what? So I want to figure out what it means. This is a big thing. Understand what this graphic is showing, like being able to put in words like, oh, this is my blank, and this is a blank over here. Who knows? You get 200 points on top of your points today. I want you to know what these graphics mean and what they're telling you. I'll take that right there. I'm going to give, I'm going to give 100 points to Connor, Brad, and Brennan right there. No one's got it yet. No one's got it yet. So this is our result. Think about what a p-value says. The probability of our results, who's gonna get the 200? Who's gonna get the, this is our result. And they have to think about what a p-value says. The probability of our results, I'm gonna like go for just a moment longer. Or, it's like the probability of our results, or, I might have to give away the answer. Oh no! <laughs> it's Friday, we're waking up. It is a result. Someone's gonna say it right as I say it. Well, these are the random chance. So these are the random chance right here. Everything in here is like what would occur by random chance. The dashed red line is a result just as extreme as our result. So when we say a p-value, it's the probability of our result or results just as extreme. So think about this, because this is 0.8 right here this is negative 0.8, and I'm kind of guessing where it's at, I'm saying it's 0.8, but it would just be the minus version of it. Like this is one, and this is minus one, because it's our results, or results just as extreme. So what's just as extreme as one? Negative one. What's just as extreme as 8? 0.8? Negative 0.8. So it's the probability of our results, or results just as extreme, um, occurring by random chance variation. Here's the random chance variation, and the null is right here. What's the most likely value of correlation to C for 50 points? So those taking the guesses right there, you got an additional 100 on top of your points, taking some guesses. Don't worry, that was a really tough question. That's why I throw out the big points, but I, I pointed at the screen. <laughs> what is the most likely correlation to get? 50 points, everyone are here. You can get up to 200 today. They got, they got a little bonus sprinkle on top of their points. But what is the most likely correlation to see by random chance? The most likely correlation to see by random chance. Yep, yep, Connor, you're right. Like we take like both of these would have the same absolute value, which is the same strength. KC right there, 50 points, you're right. It would be zero is the most likely correlation to see by random chance. If we did way more, like if we had way more data points, like if you took like a vector of numbers, um, like one through 100, 
So if you just did a vector of numbers, one through 100, um, we'll do one through 100. This is a perfect correlation, but if you look at the ones by random chance, um, look at this right here, the ones by random chance are built up around zero. And now our p-value is zero because we got a correlation of one. I purposely made a perfectly straight line. It's a uniform distribution. That's what these are showing. These are showing the distribution of X and this is showing the distribution of Y. And so these are uniform distributions. And you can see here that there's perfect correlation here. And this is basically impossible by random chance for either of them. So does everyone, do you think you have a good idea what these graphics mean? That this is your you, this is your distribution of x in a histogram. This is your distribution of y in a histogram. This is the scatter plot, and here's your permutations showing you what would occur by random chance. Here's your result. Here's a result just as extreme. And if you were to shade on the outside of these, you'd have the p-values. So the p-values are of course going to be zero. There's your p-values because there's no results just as extreme. And once again, what do we get? We get confidence intervals for the p-value right here, telling us that we have conclusive intervals to say that there is statistical significance with these, uh, with this correlation. And that's the whole lecture. But let's let's do the notes. That's everything. Like I was saying, I was like yesterday, I was like, oh, we're just we're getting so close to finishing lectures, but oh, we'll do it today. We'll do it. That's everything. If you understood all that, you know the whole lecture because we just did Spearman. So here are the random permutations. How do we create random permutations? Well, we have our original data right here, which is the observed correlation that we see. Here's our observed correlation. This is from the actual data. Nice job right there, everybody. And so this is the actual correlation we have. But then the permutations, you just mix up the data and it's gonna show you what would occur by random chance. So does that make sense to everybody right here? Like all these permutations. How many times do we generally do permutations? That's a decent test question right there. How many times do we generally do permutations? So you ready? Here is, I'm gonna put in a poll in the chat and let's pretend like people always wanna know like what's the test gonna look like? So I'm gonna put a poll in the chat and let's say how many times do we do permutations? And I think this would be a great test question. I, kept, I keep thinking like things you should know pretty instantaneously. I'll be like, generally we do about this many uh, permutations. So let me put a poll in the chat and I'm gonna edit the question and perm, Permutations. Okay, so here's the questions for permutations. And so you get to vote here in just a second. How many times do we generally do permutations? And poll has now been opened. So people are probably, <laughs> people already give the answer. You guys got it. <laughs> I like kind of pints. <laughs> yeah, you guys know. And you see that that's the kind of questions I like because it's um if you know it, you know it. You're like, okay, we generally do about five hundred permutations. Doing one would be ridiculous. You you've seen me do one. You you wouldn't do that. It just you can just see the permutation. That's like a way of nice job, everybody. Fifty points right there, everyone knowing five hundred permutations. See, these are the kind of questions. If you ask me to write these, I'll write them. And then you wouldn't know that before the class, but you would know that when we do these permutations, we're gonna get usually, and this one did 5,000. Now you say, wait a minute, but 500,000 would be insane. I mean, not insane, but it would take a lot of time. We don't want, we don't get time. So um, with this right here, let's close it. Great work, great work. Let's complete the poll right here. And now you can see everybody got that. Did everyone single person get that? Another 50 points, staying awake, working on the things right here, getting all the questions right, love it. And you can estimate the p-value here that there's about 2% on the outside of these. Now, you don't have to estimate this visually, but can everyone see here that the p-value is 2% right here? So the p-value is 2%, and that means there's about 2% of results that are as extreme or more extreme than our results. So the, the areas of the curve that I'm highlighting right now are about 2% of the curve, which is a very, very small portion, telling us that our result or a result just as extreme is very unlikely by random chance. This is statistically significant. We should know that instantaneously that this is statistically significant. Like that should just be like, boom. So when is correlation an appropriate measure? You got your flow chart. Look at this, Q, Q, straight enough. No outliers, plot doesn't thicken. This one right here has heteroscedasticity it looks like. And then we have outliers, look, minimum heteroscedasticity. 
So you really want whole muscadesticity, no outliers, no extreme outliers. Once again, how big of an outlier does it need to be? I mean, these are all like, there's no like you have to use a certain one at a certain point. It's all like, it's it's like there's times that you know when to use it and times when you're like, I don't know. I, I hate to give those types of answers, but statistics is a little more art than science sometimes. <laughs> so here's the code we've been seeing multiple times. Y tilde X comma data equals. And I love this kind of question. And don't worry, a lot of people have asked it and I like that. What does C do? What does C do? And it says down here, what does C do? A lot of people wonder what is seed and what's the point of seed we were doing something really cool yesterday i wonder if i can do it oh, i'll do it again watch this oh, you can't see it yeah i'm gonna purposely do it oh really come on r come on r go over here you good okay what does seed do does anyone know what seed does i don't know what seed does Controller saying in the chat. Okay. Got. It. Okay. Here's what seed does. They're saying. Okay. Hang on. Okay. So watch this. We're just gonna. Make some random numbers right here. This is, oh, you can't see. So just so you can see, I've made a random number. Uh, let me make it again, let me make it again. Okay, watch this. This just selects a random number. Can anyone guess what the random number will be? I'll give you 1,000 bonus points if you can guess my random number next. I'll give you 1,000 bonus points. Only first person who guesses it. And there's actually a way to do it. <laughs> there's a way if you have r open you should you should cheat and do it this is crazy fridays first person to get it i'm gonna give you guys i'm gonna give you guys another 20 seconds to crack this riddle another 20 seconds to crack this riddle let's do it let's put a timer on the clock timers on the board let's crack the riddle no one's guessed it yet. How do I know it? Oh no. Ryan. <laughs> Ryan figured it out. Ryan. Ryan, I bet I bet Ryan's right. Let me see here. Let's do this. You ready, Ryan? You ready, Ryan? Oh Ryan, how'd you know that? How'd you know that, Ryan? How'd you know that? How'd you know that? Is next, I think I know the next one. I think I put the next one in my head. I think the next one's 342. Let me try again. Let me write it again. 342. Oh, how do I know these things? How do I know this? Ryan, amazing job. Well earned. And Ryan, what I'm guessing what you did was, is you ran the same set seed, and then you generated the third random number from it. You have to like reset it and run the third random number. So um, good job. People saying like 204 and stuff, 50 points right there. Uh, so Emily, amazing job. Uh, if you notice, I ran it a third time. So I, if you set the seed, watch what happens here. I'll get 204, which is the first random number. I'll get 322, and then I'll get 528. So setting the seed sets the randomness. So I can reset the seed, and I'll get 204 again, and I'll get this. But you can just keep running it, and you'll keep getting randomness like this. Now, if I reset the seed, it sets the seed over, and I get the same randomness again. Does that make sense to everybody what set seed does? And the answers people were giving, excellent answers. I think I'm on a different set. Okay, here's one thing to check. RNG kind. Run this and see if you have this right here. And here, I'll drop this in the chat. Um, sorry for those. You know what? Let me do this. One, two, three. Did anyone say 19724? I don't think these numbers were given or 118. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, everyone should be using this right here, I think. I think this is the default. So <clears throat> there's different ways R can generate randomness. And so those are the numbers. You got these numbers here, Dennis? So Dennis, if you got these numbers, change it to rejection. 
So Dennis, did you put him in the tower right here? 19, okay, ni Dennis for, yeah, Dennis, you get a thousand. Yeah, Dennis, I didn't notice. Oh, did Alex also? Alex, you also get a thousand um, because you guys were using the different RNG kind. Yeah, Alex and Dennis, I just saw that right there. I did, sorry, I didn't see that 19. So you were doing the proper thing. You did set the seed and you did do it. So you guys also get a thousand crazy points here. But yes, sorry, you, you, you were using the rounding but if you run that code right there, it'll change the way. And there's a warning if you use rounding. Um, I think we're using rejection though. So it says, it's just a warning. It's like, it's like, do you wanna use this or whatever? And then we can change it back. And let's see, are we using rejection? Yeah, we're using rejection. So that's, it's just the way it generates randomness. It's like to explain, it's like playing on PC or playing on Xbox. Like the seeds for Minecraft are different if you play on PC or Xbox. So if you're like, oh, you should try out this world, and you're like, I'm getting a different world. And it's like, oh, you're playing on Xbox. So everyone who plays on Xbox will get the same seed. So everyone who uses rejection will get the same results with this. Everyone who uses rounding will get the same results, but they're going to get different results. It's like using a Minecraft seed on PC or versus Xbox. You'll get the same results on the PC. You'll get the same results on the Xbox, but Xbox and PC will have different results. Does that make sense to everybody right here that this is like the way it generates randomness? Now, yep, exactly. And I didn't, this is something I didn't know till about a year ago because we kept getting different results every once in a while, just the way people's RNG, because this is the random number generation, stands for random number generation kind, and it's the way it generates the random numbers. So you have to, you can set that right there with that. That's how R, R has its random number generation, depending on different types. And there's like a thing called like super duper. It sounds awesome. Let's hop back right here. Oh, didn't hit the button right. Wrong button. Oh, wait. What? Watch this. There we go. <laughs> Skip the animation. <laughs> okay. Wonder why the preset. Yeah, I know, right? I don't know why. I don't know why it's like why R. It might be Mac PC. Like maybe one of them has a certain one. I don't know. That's that's. I don't know. And we've had to like I'll have to send emails every once in a while. Like hey, these seeds are this. Like make sure to do this. It's yeah. It's confusing. And I think in more recent versions of R, they updated it. And I don't know. It's caused me issues. So. There's the results, there's the Spearman, there's the Pearson. Here's the results right here we've talked about. Rank-based rank based correlation. Let's just kind of talk about this briefly right here. So this is what we were getting at. So what would you use for this one? Let's see in the chat, like instantaneously, when you see this right here, you should know this is instantly what kind of relationship. I'm kind of pointing it out. Look at the trend I'm doing in the data. It's not so much because of that. That's an outlier, but you know, that's like, okay, it's an outlier. This trend in the data right here denotes something to you. What kind of correlation? Once you see this, you need to know this instantaneously from this class. You're like, oh, that's a classic what? Spearman, Spearman, Spearman. Yep. This is classic Spearman. Now, this right here, if you go to your chart, is where we say it's non-monotonic. At this point, you'd have to try something like a transformation. Who knows what? I mean, you're, you're going to not do Spearman or Pearson on this. This is Spearman right here. This is definitely Spearman, and this is, we need something more just outside this class of what we're showing you right now. There's ways, it's tra transformation, which we've done a little bit of, but you'd say like, okay, we're not, Spearman and Pearson are not gonna handle that well in its current state, unless you transform it. So as we were saying, all you do is you take the numbers and you would go here to the lowest X, and that becomes, well, you go here to the lowest X and it becomes the lowest value. You go to the second lowest and that becomes number two. All you're doing is assigning to these the order in which they appear. So you're just going to assign the order of these, and you're just going to put them by their ranks. You'll do the same for the Y. So if you notice here, if I was actually filling this out, I'd be putting in just the orders in which they appear, and then all you do is run correlations on the ranks. That's it. So all you do is give them rank values and then correlate these numbers. That's it. It's rank correlation. Just think about what it's saying. It's the correlation of the ranks. So you get the ranks, which is just you put them in order. You just say this is the first, this is the second, and then you just run correlation on that. It's rank correlation. Once I realized that, I was like, oh, it's just like you just turn them into ranks. And it's super easy to get. All we have to do is do y tilde x comma data equals, and we can see here the correlation of Spearman. Now, and that's, I think that's it. Yeah. It's just plots and stuff from here, just showing you. Now, don't worry, we don't have to go through this. It's just showing you like coolness with plots and things you can do. It's kind of a little like, hey, you can add this, you can add this. So if you want to do plotting stuff, it's really kind of neat to look through here. And it shows you all the different like colors you can use and text you can put over plots. And 
you can run this right here and create this plot and you can just see all the different things you can do. But like I was saying, I was like, man, we're so close to done with that chapter. We're so close. And that's got it. Who here, who here feels pretty good about correlation right now? Like you feel like you're, you're back to like, what's going on with correlation? Let me pull up some R Studio here and let's look at just an example. But do you feel pretty good about correlation right now? So good. Oh, I like that right there. Yeah, 50 points. Let's throw some points out. Let's see here. If we want to run correlation, let's go to survey 10. Let's go survey 9, 10, or 11. First person, what should I get? 50 points, 9, 10, or 11. Survey 9, 10, or 11. Pretty good. I like pretty good right there. Survey 9, 10, or 11. Which one are we going to use? 10. <laughs> you guys know I love survey 10. <laughs> survey 10 is the easiest one to use. I, oh, I didn't close it off. There we go. Now I broke it. Um, okay, I want to point out an error right here that people will get. Please take a look at this error. Maybe people have already had it. Does everyone see this right here where it's got the plus? The plus is going to be an issue. If you can't see, there's pluses right here. If you get this right here, click escape, escape, and you'll get out of it. When I download this, I'm a front canvas to save as an RMD. Um, when you see that right there, go to file, save as, and delete the .txt. And, and tell me if anything like that happens. That's a, I think it's a browser thing. I think some browsers download as .rmd.txt. And I've been, and if we can hopefully replicate that, because that's been an issue for a while. It doesn't happen to me, so I can't figure out how to fix it. But um, go to file, save as. I know that's a way to fix it. If you go to file, save as, and then delete the .txt off of it. So try that right there, Ben. Sorry that's happening. Um, I've definitely heard that from people. Um, you got it. It fixed it. Good. And then you should see the chunks reappear. Good thing finding out right there and good thing asking because that that happens. 50 points, Ben. Thank you for saying that. Like during class, um, I don't mind. That's a common thing. And I wish I could narrow it down and say like, oh, Safari causes this issue or like I can't figure out, I can't replicate it and I can't figure out, I just know what happens. So I know how to address it, um, but I can't replicate it and figure out how to head down anyways. Good. So we got survey 10 loaded up. Stupid graphic error <laughs> every day, every day with that graphic error. And don't worry, it's just, it's like the plot window error. And now we're going to go to associate. We're going to do our trick right here. And the trick we're going to do is we can look inside of here. Yeah, we're probably good at using that. We're just going to look inside of here. Also, if you want, you could load up library dplyr. You have to install dplyr. So make sure if you want to use dplyr, you have to have dplyr installed. And you could go here to glimpse, which is one of my favorite functions. Glimpse lets you take a glimpse of the data set. And with this, we can actually copy the names. OK, so what should we look at here? How about we look at people's GPAs. Let's look at people. Let's let's look at G, people's GPAs. And how attractive they think they are. Let's find out what's going on here. And now we need data equals survey 10. That's like the minimum requirements for what you need. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit here. So the minimum requirements of what you need is y tilde x comma data equals whatever your data frame is. Does everyone see the format here is y tilde x comma data equals. Classic stuff, we'll use that a lot. And then we just put our y variable in, our x variable in, and then this right here. So we should run this and it runs and we're good. And we can see here, and let's take a look at the graphic. I'm gonna go away for a moment, boop. Um, the Spearman is stronger than the Pearson. And you notice there's outliers. This is kind of a blah relationship either way. But um, there's outliers, minor heteroscedasticity. I'm more concerned about the outliers down here. Um, and I'm shocked that Spearman's actually finding what looks to be statistically significant. How do I know it's statistically significant? Well, I don't see any permutations outside here and any permutation. The Spearman might have an estimated p-value of zero because it doesn't have any results outside of the range. Pearson definitely, and it's negative. So I got to watch out. These are negative Pierce Spearmans and negative Pearsons. So the value of Pearson looks to be about negative 0.04, and the value of Spearman looks to be about negative 0.11. We can confirm this over here by going to the output, and there it is, negative 0.04, that's where that point was at, and negative 0.11, that's where this point is at. It's important to know, I can literally show you this graphic on the test, and I can say, what was the value of the Spearman correlation? And I could come up with different values, and I could, I could put, I don't even have to make it a multiple choice guess. I could uh, just have you enter in the value, and you'd have to look at these graphics and figure out what's going on. But 
you know, it's, I think it's because if you look here and you see Spearman, then you're like, oh, there's a line here and a line here. <laughs> so hopefully it's, I mean, I think that'd be a pretty obvious question right there. I think it'd be like, okay, it's got to be this or it's got to be this. And so you just had to make sure like me, you didn't forget to put the negative because I almost forgot to do that. And then I saw the red line was there. And as we said, the P, the P value, which you could also estimate from this is going to be zero. That's because there's no data outside of here and there's no data outside of here. Now, 26% of the data is going to be outside of here and outside of here. That's like 26% outside here and outside here. That's where that p-value is coming from. You can see it's not so tiny. So I could ask, is this one statistically significant? The answer is no. It's fairly obvious that that's more than 5% on, like total on both sides. But um, that's basically it for this output. Other than that, we're confident that the Spearman is statistically significant, and we're confident that the Pearson is not statistically significant. Who here thinks, let me hop back on the screen, if you were to look at this output for like another one, would you be able to easily analyze it? Like, let's go here and let's do one more. Let's do Heint Classic 1 and wait. So could you easily analyze this output? First question is Pearson or Spearman? First question is Pearson or Spearman? What do you think? Pearson or Spearman? This is how we do it in order right here. Pearson or Spearman? Which one are you going to go with? And why? Usually I'd have this as a written question on the test. It'd be like, which one do you pick and why? And this one's, I think this one's an obvious one. Don't worry if you get it wrong. Yeah, there's there's some extreme outliers. Yep, there's extreme outliers down here. There's multiple, one, two, three, four. Those are the most extreme. And not just because of outliers, I'm also picking up, which outliers is true. Uh, we do see a differing spread, and I'm also seeing the nonlinear. Does everyone see the nonlinear? That's going to be a key indicator to me too. It's it's got kind of this is like this is like if someone said this is why I pick examples like this. If you chose Pearson, I'd be like no, this is this is Spearman. So this is definitely Spearman. You'll also notice the Spearman has a higher. I got to disappear again. The Spearman's actually a little bit higher, which you shouldn't look at these values and be like, oh, the Pearson's 0. 0.6 and the Spearman's 0. 0.64. That's no, probably 0. 0.6. 0.67, I say. 0.67. What is it? It's 0.67. Ooh, I'm good at guessing today. Points, I've also done this output before. So the Spearman is 0.67, but you shouldn't look and say, like, oh, the Spearman's higher than the Pearson. But I mean, that's kind of an indication if the Spearman's picking up on something and is stronger. It's like, okay, the Spearman's finding a stronger relationship than the Pearson. But we we look at the plot itself and we we analyze it to see what the relationship is. And then here, um, both of these intervals are conclusive or inconclusive? Are both these intervals conclusive or inconclusive? Let's see in the chat right here. Conclusive or inconclusive for both these intervals? Conclusive or inconclusive for both those intervals? Conclusive, because they don't contain 0.05. Both intervals don't contain 0.05, and these are intervals for p-values. And please keep repeating that, that these are intervals for the p-value. And for p-values, we look for 0.05 in the interval. And if you understand this output, I mean, it's kind of the whole chapter where you look at the strength, direction, form, and unusual features of this. We've got outliers, things that don't follow the trend. The strength is moderate. Uh, the form is monotonic, nonlinear. And then the strength, direction, direction is positive. Form is monotonic, nonlinear. I think it did all. Strength, direction, form, unusual features. Direction is positive. There we go. And it needs to go in one direction, so it's monotonic. So we're good. If you understand... Like, I, I, I hope, I think we've done this well enough, and I think everyone understands it. We're going to do the craziest thing in the world right now. We're going we're gonna to start a new chapter, and this is the last chapter on the test. And the last chapter we have on the test for the, for the midterm, it's going to blow your mind what this chapter is called. You're going to be like, no way. The last chapter for the midterm is a chapter called, get ready for it, is a chapter called, it'll appear in like five seconds. Let's do our button. Last strong button. Cool. I was going to play Zelda, but we're playing this instead. This is my favorite. Here it is. It's a chapter called Regret. Let's, in a regression class, let's actually talk about some regression now. So we are starting the new chapter right now. And let's take a look at what's going on here with linear regression. Now, everything we've built up has given us this strong foundation. Oh, man, I want some crab rave. Everything we've built up has given us this strong foundation in statistics. We've literally covered the majority of Stat 201. 
We've covered how we do graphics. We've covered how we do summary statistics, like the mean, median, mode, and you know, uh, correlation and all these different things. We've covered some statistical tests, like testing the difference between means, testing the difference between medians, doing a chi-squared plot. So um, with the discrepancies between the mosaic plot. So you just had a whole, you just had about 70, 80% of the important stuff in stat one, maybe even 90% of the important stuff in stat one. You just gotta, so you're like, whoa, I just did all of stat one, the important stuff. We didn't do pivot charts and stuff like that. And we will do decision trees later on at a higher level. So these are the higher level things. I always allude to this in stat one saying things like, if you know stat one, you'll do well in 320. So that's why level one people go straight through. So now we're doing regression, but we're doing it at a higher level. So let's start doing higher level regression. Does anyone have any idea what an association is? You think about things that should be on the test. I know we say this like every day. That's how we practice it. An association is when we know something about X and it tells us something about Y. So when you think about what an association is, it's when it gives you information. So we want this association right here to give us inf Sorry guys. And we want this association right here to give us information about why that's our whole goal and we want it to be statistically significant because if it's statistically significant for 50 points it might be what if it is statistically significant it might be what if it is statistically significant it might be this it might be this 50 points who knows if it is statistically significant it might be boom connor right there practically so practically significant if it is statistically significant it might be practically significant we we can't say it is practically significant but if it is statistically significant, then it might be practically significant. Statistical significance is, is it unlikely by random chance? Practical significance is, can we actually use this? So our goal is to look at statistical significance to then evaluate practical significance. Like how can we make business decisions by this? So regression allows us, once again, um, to quantify how Y and X are related with a mathematical equation. So our whole goal right here is to build this math equation. And my brother is literally doing regression right now. This is like his last thing he's covering in his, his MBA course. So here's a bunch of business analytics questions people might ask. So we've got, if someone graduates high school with a GPA of 3.4, plays in the band, has an ACT of this, and three extracurricular activities, what should we predict for his or her college GPA? So the whole point right here is to make predictions so what do we expect here? What do we expect here? You can just look at all these, how much will be sold in week 15. So all these are just predictions. We're just trying to make predictions right here. And we're just seeing how much we expect, you know, how much do we expect a movie to make if the opening week engrosses this? This is such a huge thing. Movies are, are just big equations. You know, what's really funny. One of the movies that broke the trend for opening weekend numbers was I think uh, Batman v Superman, Batman v Superman, it's opening weekend made like $120 million. And then it just went poof, like that. Meanwhile, you have things like Endgame, which opening weekend, I think made like 190. I'd have to look, but it, and then like the next weekend, it makes like 120 and the next weekend it makes like 80 million and Endgame just like had this, like, you don't want to do like a sharp curve. You want to go like very slowly down in Endgame, of course, and Infinity War. So sorry, DC. DC, you got to make better movies. That's how it happens. What happened to Dark Knight? What happened to all these good movies, DC? But someone might in the chat might know. <laughs> but these, these movies are very predictable in how much money they make to a certain degree because you know that the movies are going to make less money each weekend. So you want this strong opening weekend. But then, like I said, Batman v Superman kind of broke that trend. Does anyone know the second highest R-rated movie of all time? The second highest grossing R-rated movie of all time. The second highest. I'm pretty sure I know what it is. They fired Christian Bale. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> Christian Bale was really awesome as Batman. I did like Christian Bale a lot. His Batman. The Nolan verse was really great. Oh, is it Joker now? Oh, I should check that out because I... Oh, uh oh. Let me go over here to Box Office Mojo. You might be right. Highest. You might be right. Actually, no, it's it's Deadpool 2. I thought it was Deadpool 1. Um Yeah, and I thought it was I thought it was Passion of the Christ. Yeah, Passion of the Christ. Joker's number four. Wow, so Deadpool's still beating out Joker. This is according to Box Office Mojo. 
And so here I can show this on the screen here. Box Office Mojo is an amazing site that tracks all uh, the data for different box office movies. Um, yeah, I thought Heath Ledger was great, and I still got to see the Joaquin Phoenix. So no, no spoilers because I haven't seen it. I'm going to watch it with my fiance here this summer, and um, so just been waiting to watch that. It's more fun to watch a movie with someone and then be like, oh, and then it, Deadpool two, Matrix Reloaded, which is pretty crazy. The Matrixes are that low. Hangover, comedy movies, those are really good to make money. Um, is it outdated? See, they should be updating their data. I think like Wikipedia or something I saw. So yeah, send me updated stuff. But Box Office Mojo is supposed to stay pretty accurate. Maybe it is outdated, Dennis. But um, if Box Office Mojo, Logan did really well, which is good. Logan was a great movie. You see there's so many. Stars Born. So It Chapter 2 did not do nearly as well. Wedding Crashers, another comedy. Comedies in 22 Jump Street. Was 20, 21 Jump Street on here? So, um, oh, it says, oh, oh, there you go. There you go. Yep, yep. says Joker grossed over a billion worldwide, so maybe it's not including international. That might be it. Um, let's go here to Deadpool. So domestic. Oh, it's domestic numbers. So can yeah. So there's the international and there's the worldwide. So okay. So yeah. Up up. So now we gotta. Let me see here. Um, yeah. So why not? Oh 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 oh. oh. Right here. Look. There we go. Go there. There we go. There you go. There you go. And what's interesting is, as you'll notice, it's a lot more recent movies. Yeah, Joker, whoa, got a billion worldwide. That's pretty crazy. So yeah, they've got the option right here and you can select. It's This is so cool. This is such a great way to do data. Highest grossing G-rated movies of all times worldwide. Toy Stories. Toy Stories. And let's go here to PG. PG is going to be the Lion King. Is that the recent? That's the recent Lion King. 1.6. Look, Disney, 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 Disney. Is that Disney? Is that, I can't remember. The top four is Disney making absurd money. Um, and then Marvel and then James Cameron. And look, PG-13 is like the, the, the like, look at the differences between these numbers, like R-rated movies, uh, you got one that's over a billion pg movies you've got you know a few that are like in the mid billion like one i mean only only 1.6 billion g and pg we need to go to g only g g rated movies you're lucky to cross, go over a billion for your top movie and then pg-13 um yeah marvel you done that's what and then look at all these billion dollar movies right here that are all and you've just got marvel 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 disney marvel and then you've got james cameron right here with these and then I, I don't know who does Jurassic. I can't think who does the Jurassic movies. You got Furious movies in the franchise. The Fate of the Furious, another Furious movie. Marvel, Marvel, DC. Hey, DC, you did something right there. Looks like, um, what's his name? I can't think of his name. Jason Momoa, Jason Momoa. Great job, Jason Momoa. Good guy right there. Just, I don't, I don't know him, but I don't know. He seems nice. <laughs> oh, he does doing the transition. That's when I like pull my hair back. Um, I hate the transition. This is what I do during the transition. I just do that. Just see me. There we go. Still waiting for the Avatar sequel. Oh, yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome right there. So here's the thing is if Marvel comes out with a new movie, do you expect that Marvel movie to make a ton of money? Like, think about that. That's an X variable. Marvel comes out with a movie. You're like, that movie's just going to make a ton of money. Like, whatever it is. I'm not saying it's going to be a good movie. But for the most part, like, Black Panther was awesome. Um, trying to think what else, like, oh, Spider-Verse was awesome. And then we've got, like, is The Immortals, is that one of the movies coming out? I'm going to go watch it. Like, they, they keep making all these movies that are, you, what's funny is, and I just realized how old I am, like, Iron Man. Yeah, exactly. When Iron Man came out, people were like, Iron Man? Really? Iron Man? He's not Superman. He's not Batman. He's not even, he's not even Superman or Batman. And then, Iron Man just like everyone was like oh my gosh this is an amazing movie so Iron Man kind of set the pace for Marvel being like yeah we can make a movie from you know like with good actors and really good stuff and then they just kept in my opinion personal opinion getting amazing actors for I can't think of I think they've just literally found all the perfect actors not that there's a perfect actor but they've they've made really great choices like um, new Spider-Man and everything awesome Tom Holland just like he's I mean, I'm a Tobey Maguire fan, but come on, Tom Holland's killing it. He's doing a great job. 
So, um, sorry, Toby fans. I mean, Toby's still great. Uh, James, what's his name? Andrew Garfield. I'm sorry, Andrew Garfield. You were you were too cool of a Peter Parker. I didn't like you, Andrew Garfield, as Peter Parker. You're an okay Spider-Man, but you knew. So, what do we got going on right here? Pizza time. <laughs> That's hilarious. Toby's best friend, Andrew Garfield's. Andrew Garfield's your favorite? Uh-oh. So, now I'm going to have some fights here. Now everyone's going to be like, Toby, Andrew, <laughs> Tom Holland. Yeah. No, Tom Holland's doing great. It is. When is... I can hear that. I can hear that line. <laughs> it's a crack of me up. It's Friday. We got to have a little bit of fun. So, what do we notice right here? These are... This is the thing I was alluding to yesterday. This is the Harris Bank data right here. Um, Toby and Tom are too soft. L last thing I gotta say. Yeah, Spider-Man 2 is awesome. Um, Andrew Garfield was a good Spider-Man. He just wasn't a good Peter Parker. He was just like... And he played... Like, you just... He didn't come off as this, like, outsider, nerdy, like who he came off as like i'm the coolest kid in school and now i've got superpowers so i'm even cooler and i mean that's okay you could be the coolest kid in school and get superpowers but it just didn't have this right right feel to it like we're like he's a down on his luck type person i mean of course the bad things happened to him that happened to i just didn't even like the yoohoo scene because the guy was like he was like two pennies short and he took like two pennies the guy's like yeah take a penny leave a penny and then he wouldn't sell them <laughs> he just cracked me up in the chat yeah, I just didn't like his, I don't know, I just, I guess coming right off of, like, going from to Toby to Andrew Garfield, I was like, eh, this has a very different feel to it, and so, yeah, I didn't, I didn't like it, he was too, he was, he was, an, he was an OP Peter Parker, he didn't have the Peter Parker problems, which I think makes the character more dynamic, um, <laughs> I think he was dating Emma Stone at the start of the movie, I think they were automatically dating, like, there was no, he was like just like that and the handling of Gwen Stacy was kind of I don't know Gwen Stacy is kind of a really cool story and uh, and the Harry in the movie the guy who, I don't know the whole movie okay I'm done with that okay so when we see this right here this is the Harris Bank data which we ended class with yesterday and what we see right here is there's some linear relationships Ooh, wait a minute right here what's going on does everyone see what's going on with this right here we just talked about this literally seconds ago Come on, we should here see two major things throughout this data. We should see two, huh? you, know what, you know what I had to do when I was in class? You know what I had to do back in the day? Back two decades ago? Oh my God, I gotta stop talking about these things. Two decades ago, <laughs> it's like not funny when it's true. <laughs> two decades ago, I had drawn these things because we didn't have printers. We had printers. Two decades, <laughs> I'm shutting up. <laughs> so what we had to do is Dr. Seaver, now retired recently, um, would have us go in here and draw on this and draw what was going on with it. So we had to go in here and we had to draw what was happening. So I was trained to go in and start drawing on it. You weren't alive two decades ago, no. <laughs> I did walk to school in the snow and it was uphill both ways if I left the top of school because there was like, it was only like a quarter mile because I lived close to school <laughs> in New York. And so... I guess I'd have to look. Was it technically uphill both ways? Because the, the one part of the school is more elevated and the other part of the school is lower, but it wasn't that much of a def elevation change. So I definitely watched school in the snow, though. Um, and so we see right here that there is a nonlinear pattern. Does everyone see the nonlinear? And then the heteroscedastic relationship. There's heteroscedasticity in this, and there's a nonlinear. So I kind of missed the whole, like, print this out and draw on it because that's what we, we had to do all the time is we had to print them out and draw on them. So... That's what this, which of these graphic A, B, C is your like perfect Pearson? A, B, C, which is your like basically perfect. Like one of these is like so perfect. Like I'm like, yeah, that's, that's perfect Pearson. As best as you're going to see when you see, I mean, it's not super strong. I'm not saying it's like the strongest, but graphic one, two or three is like really excellent Pearson. Maybe not the strongest, but well modeled by Pearson. Like it's really well described. One, two or three. Anyone know in the chat? Anyone know? One's not bad. One is not bad. <laughs> That's the answer to the question. One is not so bad, but it's three. If you look at three, it has very consistent strength. There's just this one outlier, which is not that extreme of an outlier. Like 
that's probably as extreme. I don't like the lack of data in here. Let's just do the integer values. And I think I'm gonna get a quick glass of water real quick. Be right back. I am back. Hey, what's up, Jonathan? So three is basically the one that is best modeled by, get some water now, best modeled, best modeled. <laughs> so simple linear regression. This is where people start to say, what in the world is going on right here? Let's hop over to a screener here and do some drawings. Remember, this is the last chapter on the test. So remember, I don't know my buttons today. Here we are. <laughs> can't mute myself on the other screen. So people wonder about why in the world in statistics do we do the following? We write out the equation of the line as y hat equals b0 plus b1x. Go ahead and put in the chat right here, what do you usually know as the equation of a line? What do you usually know as the equation of a line? 50 points, first person. Who knows the equation of a line that you usually know? Who knows the usual equation of a line? Yes, Nicholas right there. Great job. And Brad and Ryan and Dennis. Excellent work. Now, so we're not going to, we're going to put a red on this because we're really good, bad. Y equals, and the MX, <laughs> MX would go right here. And so if you look, it's the same thing. So if you look at where, what, I had to reorder it. But please notice that that is the intercept, that is the coefficient of the slope, and that is the x variable. And now you might be wondering, why would you do this to us, Brian? Why can't we just use y equals mx plus b? I mean, technically you can. I can't control what you think yet. Not yet. But right now, that sounds scary. Right now, we're in simple regression. But if we were to go to multiple regression, we'd have this. So once we get to multiple regression, which we'll be getting to very soon, like on Wednesday, when we get to multiple regression, we'll have this right here. So take a look at this. This is now your intercept. This is the coefficient of the first x. This is the first x. This is the coefficient of the second x. This is the coefficient of the, of the, this is the coefficient of the second x. This is the second x. Can anyone write the equation for three variables in a regression 100 extra points on top of your points today first person to write the equation for three variables in a regression and do it with this notation write it with three variables in your regression three variables now hint the intercept is not a variable these are the variables and if you know how to write this you know how to write the format because it's just like oh we just do this, this, it's like you always have the intercept and you have like your variable and the coefficient for the variable. And the coefficient is like the weight of it in the model. So what's a coefficient? It's just like, it's the slope. It's like, how much weight are we giving to it? And so who can do it? 100 extra points, first person to write. Everyone's like, wait, someone's gonna do it before me. Right there, Sylvia, great work, Sylvia. Yep, that's totally it. It'd be subscript, but I mean, I, mean, I just can't put subscript in the chat. Nicholas and Sylvia, you both put it in there. Excellent work, got my water, feeling great. And so that's it. That's all you have to do in the multiple regression world. Jonathan also, 100 points on top of your bonuses today. So this is why we use that equation, which you saw just a second ago. Wrong slides. There we go. Now we hit the button. So excellent work. Me, 100 points also. No, Jonathan, you got it. Surprise Pikachu face. <laughs> you cracked me. I need that. I should put more memes in here. So the reason we use this right here, and this notation, you really won't see much. But please note that this says the mean of y given some x. I'll, I don't put this on the test. 
and then betas are the actual truths. So on, well, let me highlight this equation right here. Oh my gosh, not my day. There we go. This is the mean of y given some x, and then we have here the true intercept, the true slope, and we really don't know the truth. It's like one of those things we try to figure out, but we really don't know. We have estimates. So what is the estimate of the mean of y given some x? The estimate is y hat. What is the estimate of the true intercept? B0. What is the estimate of the true slope? B1. We should see that here in the notes in just a second. Here's a huge page on notation, which I was just saying we would see, literally just a second. B0 is the estimate of beta 0. So what you're thinking about right here is when you have mu, like mu sub y, that's the same thing right here as this y hat, because this is the estimate, excuse me, this is the estimate of where we have with our line, and this is the truth. This is the mean for all y, this is the actual individual y values, and these are the standard deviations, and this is the mean of the x's. So this is a really good notation page. I would probably, if I was for the weekend, I would put these on cards. Some of them are more important to know than others, like B0, B1, you should know those instantaneously. Uh, y hat, you should know instantaneously. Let me highlight the ones you should know like instantaneously. I would know everything on this page, but if you don't know these, you'll probably do very poorly on the test. All of these right here, you should know instantaneously. Are there any questions? You should know all of those instantaneously. I guess this one also, it's just, yeah. So these are the ones I would know instantaneously. Like if I say B0, you'd say, well, that's the intercept. That's just the value of Y when X is equal to zero. B1, that's the coefficient of the X variable, the first X variable in the model. Uh, y, that's the individual observation. And then Y hat, that's prediction using the model. And then Y bar, that's the mean of the Y. And X bar is the mean of the X's. So does that make sense? The, put these on note cards, practice these. It doesn't hurt to know the other ones, but of the most important, these are the most important ones to know on this slide. Like know these like that. Any questions on this slide? So, cause this slide, I feel like you should come back to you and should practice. It's cool, it's like a see through glass. I think we're pretty good on that. Here's a very famous quote and I love it. In class yesterday, a student said all what do they say? All clusters are wrong. Some are useful. And I gave them mega points. This is a very famous quote. Oh, and I, did, I didn't put it up yet. This is, um, so I pulled out this book yesterday to show them. This is Box Hunter Hunter. This book is from like 19, when was this book written? 1970 or is it 19, uh, 1978. This book is older than me. Only by a little bit. <laughs> Scary. Um, but this book is signed by the gentleman who gave this quote. There we go. You can see the signatures on the page right here. It's also signed by Hunter Hunter. And this was my dad's book. My dad's still a statistician. He's still alive, still doing well. And um, so this book right here is by Box Hunter Hunter. And George Box uh, gave this very famous quote. So and he, he signed that book right there. Um, so George Box said, all models are wrong. Some are useful. And I always go back to um, the 2016 election and 2020 elections coming up. Word of advice. And once again, I don't care who you vote for, but vote. Who thinks people should vote in the chat? Let's get some vote in the chat. Like vote. Tell your friends to vote. Tell your family to vote. Vote yourself. So, I mean, don't vote for I mean, if you want. If you're running for office, vote for yourself. I mean, that's a good That's a good bit of advice. Vote for yourself if you're running for office. I mean, <laughs> but vote. Yeah. Go out and vote. And I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. Once again, my goal in this class is not to give you any sort of opinions on these things, but go vote. And um, you can, of course, tell your friends and family, you can make a case for what you believe and why. So vote and you can get an absentee ballot in Tennessee due to COVID-19 now. Cool. There you go. And so all that good stuff. And I got to figure out my situation with going to Texas. I got to figure that out because I'll, I'll be in Texas starting in July. But do I re-register like moving during an election year. I guess I'm still a Tennessee resident because I don't plan on becoming a Texas resident. I'm like kind of just in Texas while I, I'm i still going to work in Tennessee and the plan is to come back to Tennessee. So I guess I'm still a Tennessee resident, right? Because I'm not going to, I mean, because it's not like I'm like, I'm going to live in Texas the rest of my life. I'm like, I'm just living in Texas while I, while we're doing, while we're doing residency school. I'm not a resident. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to figure that out, you know, election year moving. Request an absentee ballot through Knox County. Yeah, so that's probably what I should do. So go vote, very important. And why do I bring this up? You know, here's the crazy thing. I want to show everyone, and this is what people, 
let's go look at this. Uh, 538 election night 2016. Um, there's a really, oh, let's see, I've already been here. Cool. Let's hop over to the page. Let's take a look. So uh, this is Nate Silver's page. And, um, oh, no, it is not. Oh, wait, mm, that's not the one I'm looking for. That is the forecast. Here it is. See, I've been to this one too. Um, no, this is not the right page. It's not the right page. Where is your 538? Oh, 528. <laughs> 538. Uh, here it is. Wait, wait. Here it is. Perfect. We found the page. I think the states determine how long you can be in the state until they require you to change residency. Oh, cool. Oh, I got to look into these things. Um, have to mail in. Yeah. So no, I'll, I'll look into this. I'll see what's going on because yeah, I got to make sure I follow, you know, well, I need to look into this to make sure I'm following, like, can I still hold my residency? Cause I don't have a residency currently in that state, but I don't know. Do I have to get a new license? I don't know. So this is the, this is the pretty much the first time I've moved as an adult. So I don't know how to adult. Um, so here we go. Let's take a look down here. So what people don't realize about this is when the election night started, this people say, well, wait a minute. Nate Silver was predicting a 71% probability that Hillary Clinton would win and 29% chance that Donald Trump would win. And this changed throughout the night with new information it updated. And of course, by the end of the night, well, then it, it's 100% because, I mean, once you get enough electoral votes, then it's decided. But notice down here what we have on the bottom. The bottom is graphics, which I'm zooming in crazy huge on, what do you notice we have right here with the shaded regions for we've got the expected electoral vote and then there's shaded regions right here what do you notice what do you think these shaded regions are anyone have any guesses what those shaded regions represent to us and they're a certain percentage to say i am kind of that confidence intervals yep 50 points right there both of you they're they're confidence intervals and look at this trump's confidence interval goes above Hillary's lowest. So at the start of the night, they're saying that Trump, 95% confident, could be above Hillary's, even her predicted, and then Hillary could be below Trump's predicted. And so you can see the confidence intervals. And what do they start to do? Look, they start to overlap. This is probably where it's 50 50 ish, or is it not just 50 50 right there? But the oh, because Trump's gone above. And then you can look right here where it starts to overlap and change. You're getting towards these 50 50s here. And then Trump starts to go above and the intervals start to get further apart. As you go, we'll zoom out a little bit here. But you can see right here, the intervals have no connection now. So the interval over here when it has no connection, that's when Trump hits 100% basically is the intervals. It's hard to see now behind my head, but there's no connection. And if you notice as the night goes on, and this is what happens with you know more data, the interval gets tighter. So the interval due to more data is getting tighter. And so people say, well, they got it wrong. And it's just, no, it's like, there's uncertainty. And as the night went on, we became more certain. And, you know, basically Trump's, this is, and this literally was updated as the night went on, Trump's end result is actually contained within his 95% confidence interval. If you take this over here and plot it all the way to back over to the left, it's at the very top of his 95% confidence interval. And Hillary's result right here is at the very bottom of her 95% confidence interval. So if you look at that right there, we could plot, I'm pretty sure I've done it before, but Hillary's result is at the very bottom of her 95% confidence and Trump's is at the very top of his 95% confidence And it's it's only 95% confidence Could be wrong. 5% of the time, it won't contain the truth. So I found it very interesting, and we'll see what happens this year, like how good they are at the predictions. But what's even what's even more amazing is they show you like every state breakdown. So I love these graphical results. It's just so cool to see like every state and how the predictions went. And you can see massive changes like Nevada. Um, I guess Nevada went Hillary. And then North Carolina went Trump, but it was like a 50-50. And then Pennsylvania, it looked like Hillary was going to win, and it went Trump. And so you can see all these different things. Trump had a shot in Virginia, and then it went Hillary. Um, but you can see such great breakdowns showing you the trends. And I love visualizations like this. I think it's so cool. And this is what we need to like learn how to do and tell the stories of data. So why do I bring this up? Was this model wrong? Was it wrong? Was this model wrong right here at the start? Was it wrong? Hint, it's like every other model that exists. 
Well, it was wrong. Every model is wrong. <laughs> no model. Yes, Andrew, all are wrong. Yes, Andrew knows from our class. Just little, all models are wrong. Some are useful, but very useful. Yes, it was. This is extremely useful. Just think of the story it tells. Like it's it's so wrong. It's it's not going to perfectly predict everything. Every model's wrong. So when someone's like, it got it wrong, you're like, well, yeah, because it's it's math trying to interpret reality. But how useful is this model? This is a very useful model when you look at it. And especially as they got more information, they were better able to predict. Um, and yeah, so it's it's always going to make, like, especially predicting into the future. No, it wasn't wrong. Nate warned people not to make. Yes, 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 yes. Alex, 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 I'm throwing you an extra 100 points. That's the thing is like when we say there's like a one in three, or which this basically is, this is actually higher than one in three. It's actually like three out of 10, basically. Um, it's not saying that like, oh, we're more likely to win, so we'll win. It's simulations. So there's actually simulations right here. It's saying in simulated results, Trump wins 29% of the simulations. And so, but there is no true model out there. I mean, we, there's a theoretical true model, but I'm sure Nate would also say all models are wrong, some are useful. And it's not that Nate was wrong in his predictions. It's that there's no, it's just, it's just math trying to predict reality and which we do, which is the point of it. Um, oh really? That's so cr Alex, that's awesome. And I love seeing these things. I think Nate Silver's great at this stuff. So I always look at Nate Silver's models and election night last year. I wasn't watching last year, election night, uh, 2016, I was not watching, uh, any news channels. I was just watching Nate Silver's feed. Cause they had like a, I think I was watching the live election feed. Like they do like, uh, you hear or they had a live election feed and I was watching that rather than, um, I wasn't watching like news channels cause I was like, I'm just going to listen to Nate Silver and see what he says. And yeah, you no, know, Nate Silver is Nate Silver knows his stats. And this is a very famous quote from George Box. All models are wrong. Some are useful. And that'll probably appear on the test somewhere. So it's basically saying like when we try to model reality with mathematics, you know, we get good approximations. We can get good approximations, but literally trying like the world is not some literal mathematical equation and so nate silver is using very high level mathematics but still how does he know all the very he doesn't but his models are good his models are great but they're not it's not the right model so it's not all models are wrong the like, hell models are bad it's all models are wrong like there's no no one's going to get the right model and nate silver has very useful models so i love that quote i think it's excellent it's yeah and here's the regression equation again. What's the maximum? 200, unless we went crazy and did some crazy points. So right here, we have actual, actual things that are existing where we have the um, equation of gravity. We have M equals MC squared. Now, this is not what our class is doing. Like, I think this is where people get confused. Like, Nate Silver's models are not this. Nate Silver's models are not uh, gravitation. They're not uh, theory of general relativity. Nate Silver's model is not uh, E equals MC squared. This is not Nate Silver's models. Nate Silver's models is trying to put mathematics onto the real world. Does that make sense? Like, we don't do physical laws in statistics. We do, uh, let's try to explain how far a baseball player hits a ball. And let's look at like how many days they practice. Let's look at um, how quickly they swing the bat. Now there is some sort of physics behind it, but then we're going to try to like maybe have our players hit the ball harder and faster and like have a player hit more home runs. But while there is a physical equation that explains it, we're saying like, okay, how do we get this player to hit the ball like more home runs? What explains home runs? And then we look at the variation in that and then we try to like control for the variation. But we, we do know some of the things like, okay, it's, it's your literal bat speed. That's part of the literal physics behind it. But then like what controls bat speed would be like how many days you practice, um, who's your, who's your batting coach. So like, you know, these are things Julio might consider because there's the literal physics that control it. But then there's like the statistics, which explain like the components of the physics, like how fast you can swing the bat is a component of who's teaching you how to swing the bat. How many days are you practicing? How strong are you? And, you know, like, like it, it's very hard to do this. And I think this is where people get confused on statistics versus physics, which we're not doing. So 
regression is not a physical law. This is one of the biggest quotes I could ever give you is that regression is not a physical law. We're not building physical laws about reality. We are just trying to make a mathematical equation. We don't know what the truth is. We'll probably never know what the truth is. And these values right here are things that we will probably never know. It's And why? Why will we never know these? Because all our models are what? 100 points first person. This goes on top. All our models are what? Because we'll never know those true quantities. We'll never know the true. If there is some truth that exists, we'll probably never know it. Can't handle it. Can't handle the truth. All of our models are what? All. It kind of. You're kind of right right there. Wrong, Casey. Wrong, Casey and Stevenson. 100 points right there. All of our models are wrong. And these are the truth. We're never going to get, boom, grant an extra 100 right there. Um, all of our models are wrong, but some are useful. We're never going to get these true values. Even if, okay, you'd say like, what if we got them? Isn't it possible? Well, then you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know you had the real model. <laughs> you'd never know it. You'd never know it. And so these are some graphics just showing you like, oh, the different things. So I never found those slides useful. We've got descriptive versus predictive models right here. So what is a descriptive model? Good review for Andrew right here. Descriptive would be like how far somebody hits the ball. Predictive model would be like how far will someone hit the ball? Descriptive would be like what products are people currently buying at Kroger? Predictive would be what models will what what <laughs> what, <clears throat> what products will people buy at Kroger? Descriptive could be like how much money are people currently spending on their credit card? Like we could look at our current customers. Predictive could be like how much money will our customers spend in the future? Descriptive could be like, what are your current grades in the class? Predictive would be, what what will you make on the final? So I could make a predictive model to explain what people will make in the class, or I can make a descriptive model to explain what people are currently making. Does everyone hear the key difference between descriptive and predictive model? Hopefully you <clears throat> quickly know the difference. The descriptive model just describes what's going on. And a predictive model predicts the future. I think it's pretty easy right there. It's just like predictive models make predictions about the future. They're they're way easier. They're they're a lot more fun to do. Um, what is and what will? Yes, Andrew, fifty points. I know you're not, you're in the class right now. I like it. So the regression equation. Here we go. It's our last little bit. We got eight minutes. We got more enough time to do it. So when we do the regression equation right here, and expect I'm thinking that this assignment will be due Tuesday night. So expect this assignment due Tuesday night. I know that's the night of the test. It's the last bit of material. And also the test will be extended through onto Wednesday. So the test will go Tuesday, Wednesday. We'll do reviews on Wednesday. I mean, on Tuesday, excuse me. But next week's a pretty big week. I think next week will probably be one of the toughest weeks of the class. So sorry. <laughs> but next week's a pretty big week with the test, with the take home, with the assignments. Remember, it's summer school. So it's every every day or two is a week in the class. So it's pretty, pretty quick. And we go right here. Uh, the take home, I think I'm going to put due on Thursday or Friday, I'm going to space stuff out like this weekend, I'm going to release a practice test. Um, I'm gonna have the test written this weekend, I'm gonna have a practice test out. And then I'm going to kind of space out the remaining stuff and look at the schedule for the week to make sure we kind of have like, there could be, I don't want to do back to back day stuff, but expect there's gonna be stuff due pretty quickly. We might, you know, I might actually make this assignment due Monday. So and we'll do a lot of office hours and stuff. So it's going to be a pretty busy week next week. So be studying this weekend. Don't take this weekend off. Make sure to be studying. Weekends are a lot of time in the summer. So the biggest thing we have right here is the regression model we keep seeing, but we don't use this version of it. We use and I want to show it. Where's it at? Where are you at? Do we not seriously write it out? And that's where I want to get to today. So we have right here B0 and B1. And this is what we've covered at the start. Now, I keep repeating, and let me show it back on the screen here, that we won't be using that version of it. We will be using this version right here in green. So the version you see up top is not the version we'll be using. We'll be using this version. You should know this instantaneously. We should here have here y hat, which is the same as the mean of y given some x, but this is the population version, that's the truth. We should have here B0, which is beta zero, but this is the estimate. This is the truth. We should have here B1, which is the tr the estimate of the true coefficient. And then we should have here X1, which is, I just put a one on it because it goes with this if we're talking multiple regression, which we will be talking very soon. So the intercept, you'll hear me say this all the time. Andrew's heard me probably say this a thousand times. No one really cares about the intercept. 
The big one, which is why it's in a box, is the slope. In your assignments, you'll probably be graded pretty harshly for your interpretation of the slope. And I wish we had more written versions on the test. I wish there was more written things on the test. Because when I do the slope interpretations on the test, this is where I usually take off a lot of points. Because when we interpret the slope, I'll find people who have no idea how to interpret it. It just, it hurts. We always do the interpretations in context of the problem. So we don't just say X and Y, we say what the variables are. So we can look at some examples right here. And let's look at examples of interpretations of the slope. And here we are. Does everyone see this right here? I'm going to take this from this slide and I'm going to interpret it myself without the slide. And let's practice. This is a big thing. If the test was written, there'd be a lot more on this. Let's hop over to the screen. Okay. So how would this be interpreted right here? We have here, we are predicting what? I need to see in the chat for 50 points. What are we predicting in this model? What is the prediction in this model? What are we predicting? What are we predicting? What are we predicting? Salary, Stevenson, 50 points right there. We are predicting salary. So salary is the predicted value. Notice I kind of put some notes under here so we can see what goes with what. And then we have here the intercept is this. And then we have here the coefficient of the slope is this. And then we have here the x variable, which is explaining salary is someone's education. So please do things like this where you match up what is what. So you make sure you know what these different things are. So know what goes with what. So when I do the interpretation here, and there's lots of practice interpretations on the slide. So make sure to look through the slides. We'll probably do one more example today because we've got enough time. But we've got here different practice interpretations. And I wish we were doing more written exams. Maybe I just need to have you guys write this out. You know, I might do that. I'm saying it right now. I think I'm going to have to manually grade these. But I think I'm literally going to have a question on the test, like write out your interpretation of the slope. And you get a cheat sheet for the test. So I would put something like this on the cheat sheet. Are you ready for this? So two individuals, and you'll see this on the notes, two individuals who differ in their education by one year are expected to differ in their salary by $85. Mm -hmm. You get and show it off to the, the thing, but cheat sheet, front back. Two individuals who differ in their education by one year are expected to differ in their salary by $85 monthly salary, where the individual who has a higher education is expected to have a higher salary. And let's look at the notes. The notes are right here. Two employees who differ in their education by one year are expected to differ in their monthly salary by $85, where the ed person who has more education is expected to have more salary. And I would write that as a sentence. It's just doing the shorthand right there to make the slides more compact. So when we look at this right here, we're saying, and I want you to think about this. This is why we don't say certain things. This is the last three minutes. Big important stuff here. Don't leave yet. This is hugely important. We go, we start on time, we end on time. We're saying that if two people differ in their education by one year, we expect them to differ in their salary by $85. That's what this line is doing. This line right here is literally showing the rise over the run. When you look at it, it's just the rise over the run, which I think we show right here. And it's saying what we expect or what we would predict two individuals who differ by one unit. Now you can do two units and you just multiply the slope by two. You can do three units and multiply the slope by three. But we usually just talk about one unit increases to say two individuals who differ by one unit are expected to differ by this amount. Like for every unit increase, we would expect these individuals to differ by this amount. Now, the bad words to use here are things like will differ. You don't want to say two individuals who differ in their education by one year will differ by this. It's we expect them to, or we would predict them to differ by this amount. Does everyone hear the key difference in the wording here that two individuals who differ in their education by one year are expected to differ in their salary by $85? Two individuals who differ in their education by one year are will differ in their salary by $85. That's saying it will happen, which we don't know that that will happen. We're just saying, here's what we would predict. Like this is the trend in the data we see. We would expect this, we would predict this. And I take off big points if people say they will differ because that says like this will happen. The last thing to interpret, and we got this, we got one minute left, is the slope, right? the intercept. And the intercept right here is for someone who has what? Secret thousand points. The intercept is for someone who has what? Crazy Friday, end of class, secret thousand points. The intercept is for someone, we've only got 10 seconds on the clock right here. 
The intercept is for someone who went, boom, Mila, you got it right there. Mila and Brad, there we go. Thousand points to both of you. Crazy, crazy Friday points. So it is for somebody. Everyone else gets 50 right there. And you can put that 50 on top of yours, but Mila and Brad got it right there. Mila and Brad got the secret thousand at the end. Let's interpret this. So when we interpret the intercept right here, this one's a, maybe a little bit illogical, like if no education, but we have right here um, for individuals who have no education, we would expect them to have uh, a, sal a monthly salary of $3,229. And that does it. And that is the intercept interpretation for individuals who have no education, we would expect them to have a salary of $3,229. That's got it. That is the interpretation of the intercept. And there it is, the month, how much among people, yeah. So you can say for individuals who have zero education, we would expect them to have, yep. And then there's just other interpretations right here. Experience, tip bill, party size. If you notice, there's just five different slides on interpretations. We'll probably do another one to start class. Let me hop to the main screen. But these are the same sort of plots right here, just interpreting like bill. So two bills at a restaurant that differ in their bill amount by uh, $1. It's always a one unit change right here. It doesn't matter what this coefficient is. This is where you put the coefficient right here are expected to differ in their tip percentage by this amount, where the uh, bill where the bill that is higher is expected to have a smaller tip percentage. There you go right there. And then this doesn't make sense because it's um, among bills that are $0, we would expect the tip percentage to be this on average. Yep, meaningless in context, because it's when bill is equal to zero, we would expect tip percentage to be this on average. The slope is the major important one. Class is over though, I'm just kind of talking through. We'll talk through more examples next class, but we got to the slope and the intercept, very, very important stuff. Two, I'm not looking at the answers, I'm not looking at the answers. Two parties at a restaurant that differ in their party size by one. Oh my gosh, I got the cups. Two parties that differ in their party size by one at a restaurant are expected to differ in their tip percentage, I had to see what the variable was, um, by 0.92, where the high, where the parties that are larger are expected to have smaller tip percentages because it's a negative coefficient. And then parties of size zero, which is illogical. Parties of size zero are expected to have on average a tip percentage of 18.4%. If you, if you know how to do this, if you can look at this equation and interpret it very closely to what is written on these slides right here, and you do have the cheat sheets back here, and you can put these cheat sheets on your cheat sheet, um, but if you notice the slope is the most important one, you should know how to interpret these. And we're almost to it. We're just doing, we're doing simple regression part one, and simple regression part two will be on test two, but we'll finish this on Monday. Um, you can type your cheat sheets. Yeah, just make sure to show your front back one cheat sheet and yeah front back one cheat sheet front back one cheat sheet what have that's got it and we got to make a good test this weekend we will finish this chapter on monday we will probably i think i'll put this homework due monday yay have a good weekend brad so i'll peel it i'll probably have the homework due on monday and so, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> you have a meeting at, yeah, I think I do, don't I? When do I, when do I have that meeting? I think I do today. Um, how do I look at my schedule in here? Show me my schedule. Oh, I have a meeting at 11.30. Ah, I have a meeting at 1130. And then I have another meeting. When are my meetings today? You're welcome, James. When are all my meetings? I have so many meetings. Uh, here we go. Meeting, meeting, meetings. I have one at 1130 to 1230. And I have one from one to two. Meetings. So many meetings. And I sleep. <laughs> I don't sleep. I mean, I do sleep, but not, not that. Have a great weekend, Sarah. We did well today. We got through correlation. We started a regression. And I feel like, I feel like people understand correlation really well. Um, Spearman versus Pearson, Pearson looking at statistical significance, knowing how to describe it. I think excellent. And here, we'll get the notes ready for the next class. Go back over here to clustering. Next class, we'll start with some clustering. So Andrew and everyone, you hear Andrew? I'll say goodbye, everybody, for now. Like, bye, buddy. Ooh.
we'll, we'll play we'll play us out with some music here what's up okay we're gonna let's do some Mega Man music or punch out I don't know my buttons so I will be back Brian will return Brian will return
Brian, what's up? Hey, Adam. Oh, what's this? Adam, what are you doing? Adam! No! Hey everyone, Jason here. Um, we've tried to find someone to do the Kahoot. Uh, you know what though? We could just try and bring him back. I happen to have this. So uh, let's see what happens. Hey, sorry. For some reason, my button didn't do its thing. The, the thing's acting weird. I was so I was gone so long. My hair got way longer, like in between walking out right there, and 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 the backgrounds changed. It, it was a long time in the void right there. <laughs> Having a little fun with some some intros we've made. We've also got a Star Wars one. So stay tuned. Star Wars is the action. Doctor Brian Strange. I like it right there. Good morning, everyone. What I'm glad you guys like that intro. Jason helped make that intro. Like we, we, we need to make more fun intros. It's uh, and expect that during July. Sorry, you guys. We'll, we'll. I'll show you guys the Star Wars one. So you'll get to see the Star Wars outro that Jason and I have. So um, maybe we'll do that like on Monday or next week. But stay tuned. A lot more fun outros coming up. Mandalorian one. We gotta think. Yeah, we'd have to think of a way to do a Mandalorian. Like I don't know. We need like a baby Yoda. We're so lucky that um, Adam, the guy who snapped me away. That that gauntlet he had, I don't know how much he bought that for. Maybe he bought it for like I think like three four hundred. But that gauntlet he had, you can literally like if you hear Jason when he does like this, it's metal and everything. It's got like a full like glove inside of it, and even the stones on it light up. But you can literally like snap with it, like you can literally like snap the metal. It's so cool. It was the coolest thing, and we just had so much fun with it. We're all like we're all putting it on, being like oh, just like oh, it's the best thing in the world. But <laughs> not literally, but you get it. Um, so cool. It is time. Now, the test is coming up on Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. And then I expect the take-home to be due on Thursday. Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. But next week, and I'm warning everyone in advance, is going to be like the least fun week of this class. Because we got tests, we got assignments, we got take-homes. So here's what I suggest. Study this weekend and do the next assignment that I put out this weekend. So, and so... It's this is like the hard week of this class. Does that make sense? Like probably not like this week, but the coming week is the hard week. Uh oh, it's, it's like the, the storm is coming. I would say the first week of this class or maybe how have you guys felt like on a level of one to 10? How difficult has this class been so far? Like up until today, up until today, how hard has this class been? One to 10. And just be honest. I, just, I, I always want to know if you see, everyone's like, vote 10. Tell them it's super hard. Tell them this class is impossible. No one's voted yet. Five. I like five. Five's good. I, w I would. I want it to be like. Yeah. I want it to be a little higher. I was gonna say a little higher. Six or seven. Good. That's good. Good. Like okay. <clears throat> I like these votes. That everyone's voting seven now. Um, seven out of ten. Good. So it, it's been maybe you would say like challenging but bearable. Challenging but bearable. Right. Like that's what I'm getting with sevens and sixes. And feel free if, if you think it's a ten, tell me. Um, but from what I'm hearing from the votes. I'm hearing challenging, but bearable. Like, okay, it's pushing me, but I got it. Like, I, it's challenging, but yeah. And next week, it's going to hit like maybe an 8, 8.5. It's going to, next week's like the least fun week. And then it'll go back down a little bit. So it's going to have this little bump, and then we're going to go back down a little bit. So I'm just like warning in advance. So my suggestion is work really hard this weekend um, like this weekend, cause I'll be working really hard this weekend too. Not saying, Oh, I'm working hard. You should work hard, but we, I got this for you. What I'm going to do. I know next week's like the least, like, so I'm just preparing everyone. Next week is the least fun week of this class because we're, we have tests, we have take home, we have assignments and we'll be doing more activities once again. And the activities are meant to be free grades. Remember that I usually show the answers so you can get free grades and the activities follow along, do your practice and the answers are posted too. So 
um, please, please email me if you're stuck on anything. I'll try to help you out and just keep please asking if you're like, I still don't get it. I don't get this. After a few emails, I usually just kind of give the answer and then I walk you through and say like, well, this was this and like we try to talk it through. Um, but it seems like people are doing really well and keep using the discord. I'm going to try to use it more often too. Thank you, Dennis, so much once again, but there's voice chats on the discord. I'm even, let me ask you guys one last bit of advice right here. One thing I'm considering is I'm going to try to get more instructors on board with this whole discord idea. So that way, what would you guys prefer? Would you prefer to use, like, if you had two options, your, your instructor said to you, I can hold my office hours on Discord or Zoom. Now, don't go because you're like, oh, Brian's got a preference. He's trying to show that this would be a good idea, trying to tell other instructors. I'm going to put the vote in the chat. Um, office hours, and you can vote D for Discord or Z for Zoom. So, and I'm going to put the actual votes in here so I can, like, show it and I could show people, like, hey, um... Um, because some people might be like, I don't know how, a lot of people say like, I don't know how discord works and th the poll should be open now. And, um, you can share a screen with discord. You can share a screen with discord. And so vote against what I'm thinking up. Oh, we're seeing, we're seeing zoom vote what you want. Don't vote what Brian thinks. Yeah. People are saying discord's still weird. No. And I want to hear this. So I'm way outvoted on this. I am a hundred percent. Wow. I got destroyed on this vote and don't vote the way I think don't vote the way don't vote what Brian thinks. So, you know, this is, I think the Discord's a great idea, but, you know, of course, this is, you. So, that's fine. And that's what I want to hear. And maybe it would take, you know, we need to do like a buy-in at the start, like getting people to use it and understand it and get acquainted with it and create more of a community on the Discord. Um, yeah, and that's the thing. I think people who, who know Discord love Discord. And then for other people, it's like, I don't quite understand. And I have to put another app on my phone. So, you know, I just have to see how things go. People saying Zoom. So, it, I mean, I need your guys. I mean, I got I got destroyed on this. So I was very, very wrong. And thank you for voting against me. Don't vote with what you think Brian wants to hear. Never vote like, Brian wants this to win. No, don't do that. <laughs> vote with what you want. Because you control, like, my, like, how I, you know, what I do and what I think. You control what Brian thinks. So I was way outvoted. Wow. I thought... I thought it'd be a little bit close, but <laughs> I didn't get, <laughs> I need that sad music now. Um, you can share multiple screens at once on Zoom, whereas I don't think you can on Discord. There you go. Yeah. So that might be, so maybe there's some pros. Maybe I should use Zoom and people can log in on Zoom. See, then someone could Zoom bomb us. So I'm like, well, I guess you could Discord bomb. So, you know, people can jump in on Discord and do things on that too. So that's the, the really, like, that's why I'm always afraid to, like, if I were to share it or do things. And I always lock the room on Zoom. So you can lock the room on Zoom so no one else can join. So even if someone had our Zoom meeting number, if I lock the room, no one can join. And if you're quick enough to kick people. But it's really, I feel bad for all the educators who had to go online who are not as tech savvy. And then they're using things like Zoom and people are, you know, crashing their classes. And then they don't know how to, like, stop it because... It's, you know, it's technology. So you guys ready? It's time. It's time. We had our fun. We had our, you have to have a, t oh, really? Wow. Okay, good. They got that line of security now. Smart move. Smart move. Wow. Okay. That's really good. That'll really help with issues of security. But then how do you invite people in? Like we've had like, you know, like Dave Ramsey has joined classes and stuff like that. Huh? Well, I wonder how that works. I want to get Dave Ramsey to talk to Statuan at the start. I want to do a special, I don't know, he, he's busy and he, other people, like I'm really glad he did a thing for students. You can still have guests. I guess you have to maybe to make a permission or send it to them personally. So I'll have to look into that. Like I, so even I have to update my Zoom knowledge because I don't use it nearly enough. So then I have to look at how it's, how it's all working. So, and I think it'd be cool at the start of the semester if we had Dave Ramsey talk to like, I mean, but he's, he's a very busy guy. But I think it'd be cool if we had him like to say hey to Stat Tool One and maybe give some advice and we just put it on the YouTube channels like Dave Ramsey's advice to students, which he's already done. He's already talked to UT students. So thank you, Dave Ramsey, for your time. And I don't know. <laughs> I just want cool things. Okay. So let's talk about this distance matrix right here. Now, when we do distances, 100 points, I kind of just showed it, 100 points, if people can tell me the four different types of distances, just tell me one of them, get 100 points, 200 points max today. Tell me one of the four different types of different distances we can calculate between points. When we do our distances, what are the four different types of distances? By the way we calculate complete, boom, 100 points right there. Complete is the two furthest points in the cluster. 
complete is the two furthest points. We kind of, geographical, but not, not for us, but yep. completes the two furthest. Single is the two, I try, try, drop right there. Singles the two closest, another 100 points. Vajrana right there, excellent work. Initia, 100 points. Everyone's actually getting 100. Vajrana got 200 though. Um, and it's calculated via Euclidean, I believe. So the distance, the two, the single and the complete are calculated via Euclidean. So they're doing Euclidean. But now the two other ones, these other ones people forget, which we don't use nearly as much, are the average and the ward. Um, it's just they're harder to visualize. But this is how we're calculating these differences right here to see. Um, maybe there is a geographical. Maybe there's one I don't know, Alex. Alex, you'll have to expand on that. Like, I don't, maybe I just don't know that term for it. But maybe that's in the literature and I don't know it. And so these are the distances we're calculating between the clusters. And what is the whole point of getting these distances right here? It's to make a dendrogram. The whole point in getting these distances is to make a dendrogram right here. So please take this note. I didn't say this yesterday, but this is one of the most important things I can say. We always merge on the smallest distances. 50 points in chat, 200 points max today, but I need to see this in the chat. I need to see people know this. You always merge on the smallest distances. So often knows it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that previous slide has it. You always merge on the smallest distances. You always merge on the smallest distances. Now you're saying, Brian, wait a minute. I thought you said you could use the longest distance, but that's how we calculate the distances. This is how we calculate distances. Like how far are two things apart? This is how we calculate distances. And then we always merge on the smallest distance. You always merge on the two closest clusters. But how do you know how close the clusters are? You know how close they are based on how you calculate their distances. So when you do complete linkage, this is where people make mistakes. You calculate the two furthest points in the cluster, which you can see right here. The blue cluster and the red cluster, their distance in complete linkage is this. And in single linkage is the two closest points. But you're always going, like when you pick a method, you're not going to mix the methods. You're always going to merge on the smallest distance. So right here, you would still merge. There's only two clusters, so these have to merge. But you are going to merge on the smallest distance when you calculate the distances. So here, I'll kind of do a quick example right here. Let me open up a notebook and let's hop over to the main screen. So, ah, uh, rainbow. Hey, happy rainbow today. So... I'm just clicking so many buttons. So if we have here point one, point two, point three, that looks like a B, point four, and point five. Okay. So if we're doing, let's say, complete linkage, can you see what will merge here first? If we're doing complete linkage, what will merge here together first? If we're doing complete linkage, what will merge here together first? Let's do this with complete linkage first. What will merge here with complete linkage? One, two, boom. And that would actually merge with single also. Because here's the thing, single or complete are going to start the exact same way because it's still just the two closest things. And all the distances are just like, what is one's distance from two? What is one's distance from? Do you see how these would be the distances one is from all those? And one has the closest distance. Now you could do two's distances from everything. And you see it's still going to be that one and two merge. You could do force distance from everything. And this is what you're seeing in the matrix of values, the distances. So just to make it very clear, what you're seeing here on this slide right here are all the combinations of differences. Let me zoom in on it really big. But you're just seeing all the combination of differences that you have such that you're just viewing these numeric values, like three's distance from four, three's distance from two, three's distance from one, three's distance from five. And that's what you're seeing right here by looking at this sort of column of numbers. We could do this row. There's three's difference. Why does, what's going on with this NA right here? Why is there an NA right here? NA means it like does not apply or it's missing. It's three's, why is there an NA for that one? Why does that, why do we got a diagonal of NAs right here? It's almost as if we don't calculate something's distance, 
boom, 50 points right there. We don't calculate three's distance from three. It's, it's, it's meaningless. There is no distance. You could put zero. So I guess you could put that, but it's like, there's no reason to calculate it. So it doesn't, I guess it's smarter and it doesn't run the algorithm on that. So it's like, why would you calculate this? There is no distance. It's, it's three's distance from three. So that is showing us all of those distances. That's what the numeric values are there in that, in that matrix. It's all the distances. So the first thing we're going to merge are these two. Now, when we merge these two, they become one cluster. And now we're doing complete linkage. So what is the distance um, that, that one, two is from four? The distance one, two is from four is the what distance with complete linkage. The distance one, two is from four would be the what distance. The distance for 50 points, the distance one, two is from four would be the what distance? One, four, boom. Yep, that's the complete linkage. And this right here would be the single linkage. So this is the single and this is the complete. And wards and average are harder to visualize. Wards is gonna reduce the sums of squares between the clusters. It's gonna to try to keep a minimum sums of squares. And average is gonna use an average point to figure out the distance between the averages of the cluster. So technically, if someone's like, well, draw averages for us. Okay, okay, I'll do it, okay. I can't draw, I can't draw it here. Averages is gonna look like this because it's gonna take the average distance. That's what, that's what average looks like if we were to visualize, but it, it'd get really hard in the multi-dimensional uh, with more clusters merging. It'd get much harder to view the average distance. So that's like the average distance right there, like a, a average amount of distance. So it shouldn't be, no matter what, we're not gonna be merging one and two with three, four or five. And you can see that this is going to be, I think we did this for complete. That's the complete linkage. And that's the single linkage right there. So the single linkage is the two closest points, but what will merge? What will merge together now? 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 What will merge together here? What's our second group to merge? Three, four, boom. 50 points right there, three, four. Three, four, our second group to merge. And now we run into some interesting scenarios because now the um, complete, is that the complete one we're using? That's the complete, that's the complete, that's the complete. So there's all the complete linkages. That looks to be the single linkage. This would be the single here. So it, it gets a little more confusing right here because um, if we're doing complete linkage, it looks to me like what, what would probably be merging with complete linkage right here? Maybe it's the same answer. It's kind of a bummer. Um, if it's complete linkage, what's going to merge? I guess it would be the same answer. That's a bummer. If it's complete linkage, the shortest complete linkage is going to be this. You see how we're always merging on the shortest distance? So with complete linkage, it looks like, and maybe, you know what we could do? You know what we could do? Eh, it's going to cause too much problems if I do this. Can I erase just that? Oh, I want to erase the three. And I want to bring the three a little bit lower, so we'll change the answer. Got to erase that. Got to erase this. Okay, then I go here and I bring the three. There we go. Okay, this might actually make it so the example looks and we get a different answer here, which I kind of want to get. And then, then yeah, so that would still link together there. Let's pretend it does as long as it does. And then this would be the single linkage here, which might be just very shorter than the other one. And good, that does it. That's the single linkage. And so there, and that's point three. And then it's debatable if three and five would have merged first, but we'll pretend that it just barely went out. So um, people might be saying in the chat, but uh, do you know what's what will merge via the complete? Who can tell us what will merge via the complete right here? I think it's close. I think it's, th is that the shortest? It's hard to tell. It's definitely not those. But now the single, if we merge here, is going to merge that. Yeah, it's, um, well, with the complete, uh, complete would not merge one and three. Complete's going to merge one and four, maybe. It's hard to tell if that's shorter than that, but we'll say it is. But this one's a little more obvious because it's going to be between, it looks like this one's the shortest. So it's going to merge if it merges on single. Now, these are different merging methods. So we'll get different ways the dendrogram looks. And I think we have notes from yesterday that really show this really well because the dendrogram shows it 100%. Let me go to the notes from yesterday. 
So many notes. Oh, no. Did I save it as that yesterday? Yesterday was the 10th. Oh, I didn't save the notes. So many notes. Untitled. Oh my gosh. No. Two seconds. Where did I put that from yesterday? Did I put it in just a random spot? Oh, we might just need to remake it. That's the notes from today. Let me go back and look through here just really quickly. Wait, wait, wait. No, it's not the gingergram, though. Did I just throw it into a random spot? I should not do that. Okay, let's make it then. Okay, so here's the notes today. And let's go BAS 474. And today is June 11th or 12th. Oh my gosh, what happens to time, everybody? What happens to time? And let's go grab and make a dendrogram right here. We've got here the data frame right here. And so this is going to create the data frame of the variables. And now we're going to turn this into a dendrogram. We're going to learn how to read a dendrogram. This is how to read a dendrogram. We don't need that plot. We just need the data. And we're going to go here and we're going to get the dendrogram thing. This is just showing us the same linkage that we had before. And we're viewing it. And here's the dendrogram. So here's our dendrogram here. And they're really easy to make. They should just plot. And there's the dendrogram. So what is this dendrogram showing us? This is the key that we need to know. Look, it's so easy to just make it. We got it. So this is using single linkage right here. So what it's doing is it's merging together based on the distance things are apart. This distance of two means what? This, I would love this as a written test question. This distance of two all the way at the top or 2.1 or so is the distance that cluster one, two was away from cluster three, five, four, six. Does everyone see that three, five, four, six have joined into one cluster here at a distance of like 1.9 or so? And at 2.1 or so, everything merges together into one data set. Does that make sense? Where it's, it's where it's the distance, the shortest distance between cluster one, two and cluster three, four, five, six. This distance right here, this height, is the shortest distance because if we look at it in the notes you will see wrong button you will see that the final merging happened because we have the visualization back here with this right here now this distance look at this right here can i do it where i want to draw over it but this distance between these two points right here is a distance of about 2.1 does that make sense that the distance right here between two and five if you look at that it's a distance of about 2.1. Does that make sense? It's the shortest distance between those points because what are we merging on? We're merging on single linkage. Now, if we did complete linkage, what would the distance be at the very end? Just pretend it merged this way. Like we'll pretend it merged up this way, but, and actually it would, it would merge very similar to this. What would be the distance at the very end? You got it right there. And then it'd be the distance between one and six. So we can easily change this right here. And we can see that if we just change this right here, and this is how easy it is to change it to complete. And now this is the distance between one and six. And look, look, now one, two, three, and five merge together and four, six stay on their own. And here four and six was merging with three and five. So as everyone see in this cluster scheme, one, two, and three hang out by themselves. And then three, five, four, and six merge together before merging with one and two. But in this cluster or doing your distances this way, one, two, three, and five merge together at a height of 3.2. And the spot where it's at, that's the distance between the two furthest points in these clusters. And then everything merges together with uh, one, two, three, and five merge together with four and six because one and six have the greatest distance. It was the distance between one and six that was dictating this right here because one and six we can see are the two furthest points like visually between each other. So they're kind of keeping their clusters separate. So very, very important to know what's going on right here and to be able to create these visualizations and to talk about them. So the dendrogram shows us right here, this height right here in the dendrogram is how far were the things when they merged. And then it's always the distance they merge at. So you can do things like average. Did I close R? I guess I close R. You can go here to average. And now it's using the average distance. And so you see, look, it's like doing like four and the other one was maybe six and two and it averaged them to around a four. And I think it's wards, is it that? I always misspell it. Oh, there it is, wards. It's not wards, it's wards distance, but there we go. Use method ward 
Down spot? Is it ward? Invalid. Oh, here, wait. I never know how to spell that one. I think it's got the period. So I can never spell that ward's distance one. Method. And I, oh, there's centroid, right? And I don't even know what ward's D2. That's what it is. Ward D2. There we go. And I don't know what centroid does. So these are the difference. Yep. And so if merge on the single linkage choose the shortest. Yep. <clears throat> so, so Sarah, great question. Sarah, 100 points. You always pick the what distance. You always pick the what distance to merge on. Like you always merge based on the two things are that are the whatest, the shortest. But then how do you calculate how far they are apart? So here on, let's go back to the slide. This is where people get, don't worry, this is the confusing part. On this slide, if you're doing single linkage, the distance would be calculated by doing the distances here. So if you're doing single linkage, this is how far these two things are apart. If you're doing complete linkage, they're this far apart from one to six. If you're doing average linkage, they're probably about that far apart because that's probably about the average distance they are apart. So how do you calculate how far things are apart based on single, complete, wards, or um, average? There we go. And there's centroid, which I don't even know about. Isn't uh, two, three for single? That's what it looks like. Ah, oh, Nidin, I know, I know. Uh, the reason it's not that is because the way this graphic's being distorted um, which we should be able to replicate this graphic with this code right here. The graphic's being distorted. I know it caught me off guard the first time I used the new slides. I don't like that. Um, so here it is right here. And maybe it's still being distorted due to the uh, the Y being a little bit squished. Um, and now if we make it about even scale, which still it doesn't look like it, like it's tricky, right? I think it's a very close call. But um, according to the notes, it's this. So we might want to check it mathematically, but um, we want these to be the same. Yeah, you see now it looks, it's very, very close, but without the distortion, um, it's probably, it's, it says it's this in the notes. I think it's super close. Let's look at the distance from two, five and two, three. Yeah, I know, don't, it's no, good, good eyes because last semester we updated the notes to get more things on one slide. And two, three and two, five, what's the distance between two, three and two, five? Um, so we can figure out here the distance between two, three, and two, five by going here. The distance between two and three, I'll zoom on the thing so everyone can see. The distance between two and three is this. That's distance between two and three, and the distance between two and five is this. So it's pretty close. Uh, the shortest distance is between two and three though. So two and three have a distance of this right here, and that's what's being calculated. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, is that wrong then? <clears throat> I think it is. So yeah, because wait. Ninton, 500 points, it was wrong. It is it is wrong. So it is wrong. This slide is wrong. We must just have just done two. Wait, I was saying two. How, whoever carried the decimals on this didn't carry their decimals through because the distance from... They must have just rounded it. It looks like an error to me, unless I'm going mad here. They they annotated decimals here and then they rounded it looks like because two and three have a distance. Sorry, two and three have a distance of 2.2. .2. Two and five have a distance of that. Oh, no, 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 that's right. Yeah, two and five has the shorter distance. I'm going mad. Two and five have the shorter distance. Is lower than, yeah. So that's right, right? Everything's accurate. Yeah, I should never question the slides. <laughs> it was my fault. So um, two and five have a distance of two, two and three have a distance of 2.2. .2. So this distance, although, and we'll look at it in the better visualization of it, um, later let's make it less distorted. And so this distance right here is a distance of 2.2. .2, and this distance is a distance of like two. It's very close, it's very close. And that's why we let the algorithm do the work for us. We don't have to worry about calculating it. We're literally just going to look over here and it'll tell you right here. How do you determine the distances from the graphic? Um, like you can do visually, <clears throat> like the distance. If we were doing single linkage right here, then, and let's go to an easier one. Uh, we'll go to this one right here. So you can see the distance is that two is from three, the distance from two is from five. So think about this. When we look at one, two as a cluster, 
which of these is going to be used to calculate the single linkage between three, five, four, and six? Which will be used in cluster one, two to calculate the distance between three, five, four, six? You'll use what? Two, because it's closer. And so what you actually do is when you have your matrix, you carry through the smaller difference. So if you have to do something like this on the test, which there is this in the homework assignment too, so you get some practice at this, you would carry through the smaller numbers. You'd look right here at your matrix and you would say, okay, I'm doing single linkage. So one and two have merged together. Does everyone understand one and two merge together because one and two have the smallest distance. Now we always merge on the smallest distance. We always merge on the smallest distance. Does that make sense? You always merge on the smallest distance. Like go to smallest distance, merge on it. So that's why on the next slide you see, which I can't go next slide right now, but on the next slide you'll see that these have merged together into one thing so they have no distance from each other. Now the distance from one and three is this and the distance from two and three is this. So if we merge on single linkage, if we're doing single linkage, what will be one, two's distance from three? If we do single linkage, one, two's distance from three, and this is the most important thing. If you know how to do this, then you'll have it down. One, two's distance from three will be what? Exactly, then you're right. Yeah, it, at the first merge, it doesn't matter because we already have all the distance calculated. Yep, it'll be 2.2, .2. yep, yep. And that'll be two threes distance. Yep, everyone who's saying it's two threes distance, that is correct. Um, and the distance will be 2.2. .2. The distance is the two three distance because that's the shortest distance. But if you were to do complete, what number would you carry over? If you were to do complete, what would go in your next matrix of values? If you do complete distance right here, the distance one, two is away from three. If you do complete, what number would carry over? 2.7. And that's if you do complete, you would carry over 2.7 to the next distance matrix. So you just look at the distance as it is away and if it's single, you carry the smallest difference. Um, if it's complete, you carry over the bigger difference. And then once you make your matrix, what do you always do on your matrix? When you make your matrix, see there's the 2.2, .2, which tells us we're doing single. So we know this is single because we carried over the smaller dif distance. Um, so in here, we'll do it again, Adam, you ready? So now on this one, what will we merge on right here? Let's pretend just for a moment that we're doing complete linkage what clusters will merge just pretend for a moment that we're doing complete if we were doing complete what two clusters would merge in this matrix this is a great test question if we're doing complete linkage what two clusters would merge complete linkage what two clusters merge this is the trick it's where people make the mistake remember the note from chat earlier remember the note from chat yep yep jordan 100 percent, 100 points jordan you're right this you say, but wait a minute, I thought it's complete because we always merge on the smallest distances. We always merge on the smallest distances. So this will merge because it's the smallest distance. But then when we calculate the distance, when we, and this might help Adam, when we calculate the distance, then that depends if it's single complete average or wards. So we always merge on the smallest distance, but how we calculate the distances depends on the method we're using. So now that we merge this together right here, three and five will merge into one thing. So then it, it means it has no difference distance because one and two has merged. So one and two is in a cluster together right now. So one and two has no distance from itself. So one, two, there is no calculation of distance because one, one, two is wards. I'll mention that in a moment here. And then that one's more complicated. That one we wouldn't do distance matrices with because it's, I'll mention, I'll talk about it more in a second. That one's, that one's like the weird one. <laughs> um, so what we have right here, and remind me, Nin, if I don't mention it after we do this example, be like, tell me about wards, because I will. It's kind of cool. It's kind of fun. Um, and it is in the assignment for this, which probably we'll talk more about the data later on. Um, so this right here, when three and five merge, what will be three? If we're doing single, what will be three fives distance from two? First person, 100 points. What is three fives distance from two? I'm working on it in my head. These things can be really tricky to look through sometimes. What is three fives distance from two now? What is three fives distance from from one two? What is three fives distance from one two? Is it? I think you're right. Yep, yep. I think you got it. Um, let me show exactly what we're looking at right here. Um, so what we need to identify is we need to identify fives distance from two 
and three's distance from two. And it was the shorter of the two distances. So, and two and one, there's, it just put all the, the values for one, two into two. And so we don't need to repeat the values because it would have the same distance. So when you look here, we're going to see that two's distance from three, five will be two in the next line. So two's distance from three, five will be two. And we go right here, here it is down here. So, oops, zoom in. So two's distance from three, five, it's at the very bottom of the slide. Two's distance from three, five is now two right here. Now, because of annotations of decimals, it's hard to see what will merge next. Oh no, it's very easy to see. This will merge. You always merge on the widest distance. You always merge on the smallest distance. So we are gonna merge together four and six right here. Four and six will merge because they have the smallest distance. And then what will be four, six different distances from, since we're doing single, what is four, six's distance from uh, three? What is four, six's distance from three? What is four, six's distance from three? And the two options are this or this. And we're doing single linkage. Two. Yep, because it's the closest. And so four, six will have a distance and we're doing single, so we take the smaller of the two. And four, six is distance from three. Sorry, it's at the very most slide now. Four, six is distance from three. Here we go with four and there's the distance from three. And that's the number we carried over. Is it making more sense how we choose which numbers to carry over? If it's single, you take the smaller of the distances and carry that through to the next one. If it's complete, you take the um, larger of the two distances and carry it over and average, it, it, we, that would take too much time. We're not gonna do that one by hand. Um, but wards, wards is a cool one. Um, the thing with wards is, and let's just make the visualization because it'll help us see it. Where's my, oh, here it is. We didn't show it, okay. So with wards, and I think it's, oh, no, here's wards. So what wards over here is computing on the side of it, don't be slow computer, is it's computing the sums of squares. So this right here is trying to minimize the sums of squares. So it's gonna merge things together based on the sums of squares from the cluster center. So it's a lot like k-means where we have cluster centers and then it's gonna compute the sums of squared error from those cluster centers. Does that make sense there, Ninton? That this right here, this value right here on the left is the sums of squares you would get when four and six merge. And what happens as more and more things merge together there's more sums of squared error. So you're seeing here a sums of squared error of this when these merge into one, and then this cluster has this much sums of squared error, and this cluster has this much sums of squared error with the words distance. Then when one, two, three, and five merge, the sums of squared error is a little bit more than three. And then when everything merged together, the sums of squared error for the overall cluster is this much right here. So what would literally be happening right here, we can draw the graphic. So oh, we just need to draw the first part of it, I believe. There we go. The final thing you're finding, and let's do a picture of this. The final thing Wards is telling you is the total sums of squared error of this graphic. So if you were to visualize that height of a six point something, like 6.8, um, what you're finally getting at the end right here is if you were to put just one central node to this data in the center, and then you were to calculate the sum of the squared error right here. So this would be the sum, and it looks like a lot of it's coming from this one right here. So this would be the calculation of the sum of the squared error for all this right here. So that's the sum of the squared error right here. So, and it should be pretty accurate to that, but that is the sum of the squared error, which is what words is calculating. And it's trying to reduce that. And it's figuring out the way to join all these. The center might be more towards like right in there but it's gonna pick the center of the data and it's going to reduce it. We don't have to do that one by hand, but we should understand theoretical that Ward's distance is trying to minimize the sum of the squared error. And all these are on the notes right here going through. Let's hop back to the main screen. So there are some practice slides with this right here and it shows you how to do it. There, it, This is in the assignment. You should know these four methods. Seems to feel, yeah, exactly, yeah. It's easier to find the shortest distances and wards, you'd have to keep recalculating the sums of squared and you'd have to merge on the smallest sums of squared error. So wards will do all the calculations for you and calculate all the sums of squares if things were to merge and then it'll merge things together based on the smallest sums of squared error. So it'll it'll figure out what is the smallest sums of squared error and it'll do that, it'll get it, it'll do it all for you. So how do we know how many clusters there are? So what I try to look for here is, um, 
So merging together means that they go into one cluster. So when one and two merge, they become a cluster. They're now a cluster of one, two. When three, five merge, they're now a cluster of three, five. When four, six merge, they're now a cluster of four, six. Now these merge right here at this height, and then everything merges together into one. Imagine balls of clay, like these are six balls of clay, and then you're just gonna put them together and kind of like mesh them into one ball. And by the end, everything is merged, like all six balls are merged into one. Does that make sense, Adam, that things, it's just like six balls of clay. We're gonna mesh together ball one and ball two here at the start, and then ball three and ball five are gonna mesh together at this much time. It's like the distance they are apart, but we could just say like this much time has occurred. And then we're gonna do four and five. We're gonna merge those together, or four and six. And then three, five, four, six, the two balls that are slightly bigger now are gonna to merge together. Then we've got like a big ball here and a smaller one here, and then we're gonna merge them together at the very end into like one ball of clay. That's awesome, great question, Adam, 50 points. Thank you for asking that. Hopefully that helped you understand a little bit better. Can we talk, can we think of them as, yeah, that and that would work for with, um, that really is a good way to think of wards, 50 points in. That's a good way to think of wards. Wards, because the radius, it's going to get the, the sums of the squared distances are going to get bigger with wards. That's a very good way to think of wards. Could you go over how to turn the differences between the clusters on a dendrogram? Yep. So these distances right here are the distance at which they merge. So this one was done with, I wish it would tell me which one it was done with. That's the same graphic. Okay. This was done with single. So this here, this distance right here, was the distance between one and two. This was the distance between three and five. This was the difference between four and six. This distance right here, does everyone see I'm pointing to this right here, was the what is distance between what, 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 what? 100 points first person in the chat. This distance right here is the what is distance between what, 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 what? And here's the help for it. It's, it's single linkage. It was the what is distance between what, 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 what? It's where three, five, four, six merged. That is the distance they merged at. And it was the what is distance between those clusters. Nin 50 points right. So it's it's this distance right there is the shortest distance. The shortest distance between three, five, four, six. Yes. That is what that tells us. This is the distance at which they merged, and we can see it right here. I know visually it might look a little bit weird, but that's the shortest distance between three, five, four, six. So they merged together, and that spot I was just showing you is literally like this right here, that right there, that spot is this distance you are seeing appear on the screen right now. That is that distance you are seeing appear. And that distance is a distance of right about two. If you kind of go over here at the bottom of the graphic and you kind of trace over, it's this distance right here between, it's that black line. That is the distance and it's the shortest distance between three, five, four, six, sorry for the distortion on the graphic but that is the distance we're seeing it merge at. And then finally, everything merges together at this distance of right about two also. And that is the distance you see here at the very bottom, which we don't show the final merge, but the final merge would be this distance right here. And that is the shortest distance between cluster one, two, cluster three, five, four, six. And do you see how this is two clusters right here? This is two clusters right here. Guess what? If you go back to this, that's this right here. That's this area right here where there's two clusters. Um, it is. It is completely up to you. And you know what I would do? Watch this. I'll tell you when to use which one. I think this works better with complete, and I'll show you why. Um, if I go here to complete, there we go. If I go to complete, I get this. Oops. Well, you can see it, but not too well. If I go to complete, I get this right here. Here's what you want. You want this to be a creature that has actual legs that make sense. So when you have data, this one might have three clusters. Um, if the I would like to see what the literature dictates, um, but it's kind of up to you. It's kind of up to you. It's it's just competing methods. It's like, do you want to write left-handed or right-handed? Like, well, right-handed. I don't know. It's left-handed. Ambidextrous. I don't know. It's all up to you. And that's why we have competing methods because sometimes different data sets work better. And if you notice here, it's changing the result. So the result, and this one's very similar to the complete, but this right here, when you cut it, if you notice what the code has on here, we've got the cut and the cut is going to allow us to create a certain amount of clusters. So we can choose where to cut it. And where do you think, for 100 points in the chat, where do you think I should cut my dendrogram? Where should I cut my dendrogram right here? Someone give me a good spot to cut this dendrogram. 
Someone give me a good spot to cut this gender rim. I'll still throw 100 points right there. I, w I don't know if I'd go two because look where that cuts. Eh, you could. You could. I That's my second choice. My second choice would be to cut it two. You want to cut in the most 3.5. I like 3.5 better. And why would we cut at 3.5? Because how many clusters does 3.5 make? Does everyone see the difference where here, if you cut, you get how many clusters? You could do something ridiculous. You just don't want to do this. If you did this, I'd be like, uh, no. That's ridiculous. You get six clusters down there if you cut there. So if you cut here, you get two clusters. Imagine these like falling down. Does everyone see if we cut there, we get two. If we cut here, we get three. You want to get the most area of separation. Look at how, and I can't highlight, but look how there's so much separation right here. And that's what I really like about this one versus the single, because with the single, you got this area of separation. I like the much better area of separation. Let me go back to the 3.5. I think it's much easier to cut, oh, that's the wrong graphic. We gotta go here to complete. That's off the graphic. And then we have to cut it. And then we have to put a single one right here. Okay. So this one right here has a smaller area to cut in. You would cut here at about 1.8 as um, you want clear clusters. You want clusters that are, so to Jordan's question, you want distinct clusters. And like you could cut this anywhere in here, but you want a good area where it's, they're separate. Now it's not wrong to say there's three clusters, but you want a good area of separation. This one right here really has just this area. I don't, in this one, I would not say there's two. So everyone see the difference here? To get two clusters, you'd have to cut in this area, which is so small. To get three clusters, you'd cut right here across this area. So there's a pretty open area to cut for three clusters. Where in this one, the open area is with two clusters. So where you cut is up to you. You could, like we said, cut and make six clusters, but that'd be ridiculous and you wouldn't be doing clusters and you just have individuals. But you want to cut where there's an open area. More spacing is better because it's more separation of clusters, like things are further apart. And you can see this goes towards a two clustering scheme, I would say, and this goes towards a three clustering scheme. You could even say cutting there, which would give you four clusters. You have to see how many lines you cross. You'd get one, two, three, four. I don't know, and that would be at about 1.8. So I think we're using this graphic currently. And if you cut there, you'd get you'd get four clusters. I would not cut there. I would cut at something like 1.9. And then you get that. And to get this right here, you have to cut at a like, yeah, yeah you got to cut in here, which is, yeah, it's like, I that's too small of an area. I, I would rather do three clusters. So more spacing is better, separation of clusters. I don't think there's two clusters here in this scheme, the way we have it graphed. I think there's three clusters because that's your open space. Are we avoiding overlapping between clusters with spacings? Yeah, the, the less, the more spacing there is over here, the better it is in determining, like we'll go back to, we'll do average. And what do you think here is the right amount of clusters? Two, three, four, five, six. What is, um, so what's the point of cutting? That literally creates the clusters. So right here, um, and we can assign cluster IDs to these. I'll show you how to cut to, to analyze, to create clusters. Yep, because when we do this cut right here, which I do two clusters, and it's fine to cut as long as it's being cut. Eh, I should probably put a cut at three. It doesn't matter where I put the cut as long as it's in this range. And now four and six will be assigned cluster ID one, and one, two, three, five will be assigned cluster ID two. So this is my one cluster. If you notice, it just falls down right here. And this is my second cluster. Does that make sense? Like the whole point right here is to assign a cluster ID to these groups and to say, this is cluster one, this is cluster two, and to pick an open area where you've got good separation. We'll see more on this in a moment. But does that make more sense right here? What we're doing with the dendrogram? Awesome. Thank you. Great questions. Like keep asking, be like, can you explain? I'll try to do it multiple ways. And I really appreciate it. K means. Again. We're back to k-means. So another nice thing about hierarchical clustering is that when you end an additional cluster scheme, an existing cluster gets split into two, not necessarily 50-50. This makes it particularly easy to see how clustering seems to change with one or more cluster added. So literally you're breaking things apart. Like if you change the clusters, it's pulling them apart. K-means doesn't have this property. It can totally reassign. We mentioned this yesterday, that k-means can completely reassign what's what. Um, in my opinion, hierarchical cluster is actually more useful. Yeah, cool. I like hierarchical clustering. It just makes sense. Things are like being merged together. So we see it right there. Here we are with the cut tree, just showing you how to cut the tree. And once you cut the tree right here, it'll assign the cluster IDs. So we'll hop back to R for a second. What were we doing? Oh, we were doing abline. So if we go right here and we go to cut tree, 
there we go. There's the cluster IDs. And I was using this right here. I was using three. And look, can you tell four and six? Wait, here they are. Look, four and six. And I'll go away for a second again. Four and six are four and six. They're getting, it doesn't matter that they're cluster ID two. I call them cluster ID one. But four and six were here. And let's go visually. If I were to cut it, I think 1.9 on this, then that's where I cut. And look what I get. Here, this is one and two, which are in cluster ID one. And then three and five are right here. That's a cluster. And then four and six are this cluster. Does that make sense? What's going on with cut tree? It's just cutting the tree. What if I cut the tree at that? What's going to, how many clusters am I going to get if I cut the tree there? Um, we worked with k-means. We worked with k-means with clustering. We did k-means and we did nearest neighbor to talk a little bit. We talked a little bit about nearest neighbor and we did k-means, six clusters. Yep, Jordan, you're right because everything's, that's individual clusters. So it it's hard to tell, but these actually extend down further. I wish it extended them all the way down, but if you were to put this in visually right here, it's going to go below the plot. Uh, we can't even view it. And there we go. It's it's like these extend down further. It just doesn't graphically draw them. So you'd have to imagine these going down further and you'd cut across all six of them. Nothing's merged together at this height. You could do ridiculous things like uh, that's 1.6 or so. So we're only going to get one cluster in here at 1.6, I think. Yes, we are going to get five clusters here. So we're only going to get the one, two merged together. And so you see one and two have merged into a cluster and then other things are their own individual clusters. Does that make sense what's going on here with cut tree? Cut tree is just merging things together based on, we don't have to draw the visual, but seeing right here, the visual right here. How many clusters will I get if I cut tree at 4.4? If I cut tree at 4.4, how many clusters will I get? If I cut tree at 4.4, how many clusters will I get? And here's the visual. Awesome, this is what I want. Yep, oh, and you can't see it. Oh, let's do this then. Can you see that? Ooh, it's gonna be close. Good, it did it. Yeah, and I want—I just wanted you to see where it was at. There we go. There we go. At that point, everything's merged into one, and so everything's one cluster. So, I, and that's—that's that's not clustering then, because then that's just everything's the same. So, hopefully, those visuals really help make it make sense. That's my goal. Like some visuals, letting you see what's going on right here with the cut tree. So it's like literally just cutting it. How many clusters do you think we should have for this? How many clusters do you think we show for this? We show the visual in a moment. How many clusters? This one's very obvious. <clears throat> 100 points first person. It's not like I was saying a secret, like, <laughs> 100 points. Yep, you got it. Who got it first? Pedrina. Excellent. 100 points right there. And look, now the only, you could say four clusters, which is the big open area, but you could also say two. If you do two clusters, you're clustering by this and clustering by this. So it's, and everyone else, 50 points. Great job right there. Excellent answers on this Friday. So it's definitely, um, it's definitely four clusters. It's just this, this open area is created because the two clustering scheme is a second choice. You would never do three. The three cluster scheme is this tiny area right here. So to do a three cluster scheme, you'd have to cut in this little area, which is ridiculous. And then here's all the individual points, which they have a distance of zero. It actually extended this one down. What do we see more often in data? We see stuff like this right here. So this is what we more often see. And now we see a good four clustering scheme. This is where the five clustering scheme is somewhere in here. Like it's either cutting here. Or it's so hard. It's either going to be four or two. So right here. Um, you've got a good open area right here for four cut, and you've got a good open area right here for two. So someone could say two. Two is very viable on this. I mean, if you look at how wide the area is, I bet someone might say two. And you know what? We should be able to remake this, and we could look at it with single linkage because I, I wonder these things. So toy not found. Is toy? Where's toy at? <clears throat> oh, we don't have it. Is, where's toy? Did Dr. P, did you put things in your Dr. P that I'm going to have? So sorry about that. Whoops, I forgot the screen was on the wrong. I don't know. Where's the toy data? I'll have to look for that because I really wanted to do this. Um, yeah. Oh, wait. Toy is, toy is this data frame right here. Okay. And we got to set the seed. I was like, we should have it. Let's hop over to the main screen. I was like, the notes have everything we need to create stuff. And I was like, why is this not there? Okay, let's hop back to the main screen. I was really sad because I was like, I want to make this. There we go. Here's the toy data frame. Here's the hierarchical clustering. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch methods here. And oof, 
Ooh, how wow. Oh, I love it. I love the dendrogram. That is cool. Okay, what what does this suggest for um, the amount of clusters we should use? I'll just throw this on the test and be like, how many clusters? Answer's pretty obvious with this. Two. Two. Oh, I missed my seed? Yeah, then we won't get the same randomness. I like that. I'm glad. I'm glad I didn't run the seed. I like that. <laughs> Let me say, who said I missed the seed? Adam, 100 points. So I didn't get the same random result. They, they're going to be similar. Um, so you could you could run the seed. And let's see if it looks the same -ish. Whoa. You've got like an outlier over here. Oof. You see, this, this thing is its own extreme outlier. It's its own weird random data point. If we do a visualization of it, we can probably capture where 0.25 is at. Like it's going to be its own hanging out by itself, doing its own mad thing. Uh, not that not hanging out by yourself is mad, but it it this thing's mm, which point is it? Is it that? Is it that point? I guess it might be that point. That might be the the one that's causing. I thought it'd be more problematic than that. And you got some interesting stuff there. That's just such a weird. We'll do complete on this now, and we should get the graphic. Whoops! Did I click the wrong button? I did a comma there. Parentheses. Um, there's that, and there's the thing in there. We can go to average. Yeah, that would be two again. And I always get words D wrong. Ward D two. How do you spell it? I never know how to spell that one. Good thing we got a help option. If I could spell hierarchical clustering. And it's ward capital D two. Why do they do that? Make it so we can't spell it. So oh, and this one looks like three or two. So this one would be three or two. We'd if we want to put the actual cut in here, we're gonna go to and you see this is the sums of the squared error now. I, I'm gonna say three. There we go. So if you see a bad dendrogram, would it be viable to switch to another method? Yeah, that's probably good. Yeah, I think that's really good. This And this one's actually a really clean dendrogram. Um, we don't have extreme outliers. And I would say this is probably, it's funny, Ward's D came back with it. Um, once again, this is more of the art than science of statistics. Because once again, uh, which dendrogram will get us the right answer? Trick question. There is no right answer. All answers are correct. All answers are wrong. <laughs> there is no right answer. And then you could assign the cluster IDs pretty quickly on this by going to your uh, cut tree. So if we go back to our cut tree code right here, we can assign, and I was cutting it at uh, 25. So here's the important things right here. If you cut at a height of 25, you will create all the cluster IDs. And then what you want to do, this is key. This is so key. You want to go to cluster ID right here. And guess what we've done is now we've assigned the cluster IDs right here. So now the cluster IDs, and now we can go to aggregate, and we want to go to dot tilde uh, cluster ID, and data equals toy. This is key right here. This is huge. This is like your assignment, and you could do the mean. That should do it. Don't give me the parentheses. There we go. So if we look right here, and we don't have these z-scores yet, we could turn them into z-scores if we want, um, and the hierarchical clustering will do it'll we'll just do distances but um actually i like this better because this is units but if you look here um for group one group two oh that's doing the average of the group oh does it already have the group it might already have a group stored in it oh well, we already assigned this to group one so in the cluster ID is group one and then these were assigned a little bit differently for the group but you can see right here the averages across these different ones we could look at the medians and there's the medians oh there's more than one group so maybe there were four groups to start um, but you can look at the different averages that group three has the highest X and it looks like their X is differences are mainly where it's coming from. Um, is that the cut tree of hierarchical clustering? Yep. 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 That's what it does. That's what cut tree does. If you look at the code cut tree, it just literally cuts right here and then assigns the IDs to whatever is below it. Does that make sense? Jordan was doing what cut tree is doing. It's cutting the tree wherever you say cut at, like I'm saying cut at this height, and then it's going to assign the cluster IDs accordingly and the numeric order by which it assigns is not important. It's just a like group this, group this, group this. So it cuts the tree. We could cut up here at 35, and we're going to get two clusters now. So if you see I cut at 35, the visual for that is going to look like this, and now there's two clusters. Does that make sense? Yeah. The visuals are key here. That's why I'm keep cutting to these visuals right here so you can see that I've created two clusters right here, and then I'm able to aggregate. And codes like this are very important if you look at how quickly we can do it and we create, I mean, these algorithms are awesome. Like the amount of analytics we're doing is just like all inspiring. I, I love it. I think that's pretty much got it for the lecture. Let's hop back right here. But that's the, if you understand what's going on, you understand that it's just trying to create the groups right here. 
And that's it. I mean, that's mainly it for the notes. I think we just got a few more slides. And then we're going to start talking about Market Basket a little bit today. We'll finish up Market Basket on Monday. But I think that's it for the, here, look at this. <laughs> this right here, you've got an extreme outlier right here. This is the flight data set, the one I was waiting for. And this looks ridiculous because this is all of the individual points at the bottom. So it's all the individual points just going bonkers because there's so many data points. Make sure there's nothing else big in the notes. There's the cuts and taking through and then just looking through the aggregate on it. And we're rounding the aggregate. Do we also have a review session on Monday? Yep, we'll review sessions. You bet. We'll probably do, I'm going to try to do a Kahoot. This weekend, I'm going to try to do a lot of work. I'm going to go home to my parents' house probably and try to do a ton of work and um, just try to make like a Kahoot for you guys because I know people love Kahoots. And we'll do some big bonuses on the Kahoots and stuff like that because I really want to have more Kahoots. I know. And we have fun with Kahoot. So hopefully, you know, it's going to be a big work weekend. So you guys got it. You guys, we work hard this weekend. I'm going to be making cahoots and stuff. I'm going to be making practice tests. I'm going to be making your actual tests. So be working on your homework this weekend. And you guys are ready for one more set of slides to start up right here. The last chapter for the test. This is it. This is the finale of the notes before the test. And we will have assignments. Oh, it's busy, 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 busy. But you guys got it. Who here feels like they understand hierarchical clustering a good bit? Do you feel like you understand hierarchical clustering? Do you feel like you're like, I kind of, I think I get it. I think I get what's going on with the k-means, with the dendrograms. We're just grouping things together, how close they are, how similar they are to figure out marketing strategies. And it's really, this is what's so cool about it. It's the analytics part of it. It's the literal business analytics, getting there, good. Yeah, and that's, it, it just takes practice a bit, yeah. No, like eight out of 10, I <laughs> like that. It's the business analytics of analytics. So it's the, or the, yeah, the business part of it. Get it, awesome, good, just practice. Keep asking those questions, keep practice writing code. One of the best things you can do is take the code from the slides. Are you gonna provide a practice sample test? Yep, yep, that's my goal for the weekend is to have a 10 question practice test out that's not worth credit. It's just gonna be a practice test that you'll take and the grade you get on it is just a practice grade. I'm gonna use actual questions that I have on the test on it though. So I highly suggest taking the practice test. So I've got a lot of work ahead of me this weekend. I've gotta write like 200 questions. I've gotta make some cahoots because I'm doing the 320 also. And so this is like, I know I keep saying it, but I promise you guys, this is the big weeks for you guys are also the big weeks for me. So we got this, we got this together. And also I'm moving to Texas. <laughs> But I got you. We got this. So um, there will be homeworks. There will be quizzes. There will be all this good stuff. But we got this. Hang in there. We're doing this. You ready? You ready? I feel like I feel like some people are just being like, who's feeling good? Let me get some energy. Let, give me some positive things. Give me some positive notions right here. Let's. This is our one minute break right here. Give me some positive vibes right here. What's what's happening? That's really positive. We got that new Miles Morales Spider Man game. Did you guys see that new Spider Man preview? For the new Miles Morales Spider Man game, like. I might have watched that preview like 10 times, not lying. Like, it is Friday, ready to go. We got Cat in a Box right there, I love that. So if you haven't seen, if you like video games, currently making coffee, coffee's excellent. Some positive vibes right here, 50 points, all these positive vibes. Go data scientists, yep, we love data scientists. If you haven't seen it yet, it does look like a router. <laughs> I like to put a picture of like a router with some pieces of paper next to it. It does, it does. That design choice is like, yeah. It's got like nooks and crannies that just dust gets into. Like, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand how, I don't understand marketing teams. Like, I mean, maybe they want that. Maybe they want it to like start getting memed because if it gets memed, people, you know, start seeing it. Like everyone sees the memes of it. And if it looks just like normal, then they're like, oh, we won't get the word out. But if it looks like memeable, then people will turn it into a meme. But um, there's some really awesome games like Horizon Zero Dawn 2, um, if you want to buy GTA five for the 10th time, you can buy it again. Um, no such thing as bad press. Yep. And then the miles Morales game looks like super, like I was like, this thing looks amazing. I was ready to news that Nintendo will give new switch. Oh no, I need to buy another switch. Aren't they just updating the switch? Yeah. So I need to see the Hitman. Is it Hitman three or four? I need to see the preview for that. I didn't watch that yesterday. I watched the stray preview and that game is either going to be like the most amazing game ever, or I don't know. It's going to be horrible. But that stray game looked pretty pretty crazy. Yeah, Miles Morales looked Switch Pro. Oh no, am I buying a new Switch? <laughs> Switch Pro, but oh, 
maybe it'll work. The the Wii U did not work. And most people don't even know about the Wii U. Most people are like, do you mean the Wii? And I'm like, no, the Wii U. And they're like, what do you mean the Wii U? And I'm like, it came out after the Wii. And they're like, no, the Switch came out after the Wii. And I'm like, no, the Wii U came out. So I wonder if this, the Switch Pro sounds like it won't be a new console. They're just updating the Switch to maybe have better graphics, better screen. Better controllers would be nice. Better controllers on the Switch would be amazing because the controllers, while they're cool and have cool things, PSP was, oh, we got some PSP love right here. Yeah, PSP was pretty cool. PSP was really awesome. It was it was basically the Switch before the Switch. I'll say that right there. <laughs> I love Madeline in the chat right there. I have a... Uh, PSP was ahead of its time. There we go. Yeah, PSP was really good. It's just, yeah, the Wii U, I like the Wii U, but it just is like Nintendo's failed other than like Virtual Boy. The, so wait, what do we have here? We have association rules. What are we associating with all this stuff right here? It's very interesting to see. You know what's interesting is we could literally do market basket analysis on people who buy certain video games. If somebody owns a Switch, what do you think they're most likely to own for video game consoles if they own a Switch? Like, what else? Someone owns a Nintendo Switch. What would they be more likely to own if they own a Nintendo Switch? Someone owns a Nintendo Switch. What would they be more likely to own? If they own a Nintendo Switch, what would they be more likely to own? This is the idea of association rules. For games, they'd probably... Yes, for they'd, for games, Zelda would be more likely. Yep, for games. 100 points right there, Jordan. For games, Zelda would be more likely. Um, I have meetings. I have meetings. For consoles, we'd see things like Nintendo branded consoles. 100 points right there. Sorry, I have to. I have an 11:30 meeting, and then I have a 1 p.m. meeting. Too many meetings. A TV. Yeah, <laughs> you'd be more likely to own a TV. So you see all these things right here. Animal Crossing, and maybe I'll get Animal Crossing. Maybe Chelsea and I'll get Animal Crossing, and we'll have our two separate Animal Crossing worlds or islands. I think they're islands now. So she has a Nintendo Switch too. So we could be playing lots of snacks. Oh, and then we could just get one cart and we could just be like, then we'd be like, hey, I want to play the, I don't know. We're fine. We're fine. We'll share the cart. So lots of snacks. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it. So what we're seeing right here is we have the goal right here. Now, this is a review slide. If I go through something quickly, it's because here's all the things we'll be doing. We're doing association rules, clustering, classification, numeric predictions. We'll talk more about these when we get to them. Clustering is unsupervised learning. We talked about this a lot a moment ago, that there's no like we got clustering right. What is unsupervised learning? There's no, as I think it was Anisha said yesterday, all clusters are wrong, some are useful. There's no answer to the clustering problem. There's no, um, oh, you need two separate, oh no, that's, oh, I guess we, that's not fair. There's no answers, there's no R squared, there's no, we know the answer to this. So we're gonna have unsupervised learning right here where we just figure out, you know, like, yeah, this looks like a good answer. There are no answers built in. So market basket, love it. Dr. Petrie loves Frenchies. French Bulldogs, Dr. Petrie absolutely loves them. So we get some Dr. Petrie here in the notes. Now, look at what Amazon is marketing to you. It's marketing to you since you want Frenchie Bulldog socks, which are, those are utterly cute. You just gotta, you gotta love that little guy right there. And then it's marketing to you, but would you like these socks with French Bulldogs on the top of them? Would you like this little French Bulldog statue? Would you like this thing that says happy French Bulldog stuff? And would you like a French Bulldog holding your salt and pepper shaker? And then you're like, oh, you know, our kitchen totally needs this. And you know, I, I wear these socks all the time. I, oh, I just got to get these socks. So what is Amazon doing? Amazon is figuring out probabilities. That's all Amazon is doing. Amazon is saying, if you buy this, you're more likely to buy this. Just like we talked about with consoles. If you have a Nintendo, you're more likely to have this. And so you'd say, if you have a Nintendo, you're more likely to play Zelda. If you have a Nintendo, you're more likely to play this. Um, what will you also buy? Yep, and it's all probabilities. It's just probability calculations. I mean, if they started, what do you, do you think it'd be a good idea if they put cat stuff down here? Like if they put cat lover stuff, if they put like, you know, like, like, I love my, I love Garfield. I can't think of a cat name. <laughs> I'm so bad. I love my Persian. I think they're a cat, right? I love my Calico. They're a cat, right? Um, so you would be like, you'd be like, I don't know if we're marketing the right things to these people because given somebody likes French Bulldogs, it might be less likely that they would like cats. And you're like, well, it's obvious. You just market French Bulldog things to people who like French Bulldogs. Well, that's some of the more obvious stuff, but a lot of times we try to find the un not so obvious things going on right here. We try to find the not so obvious. So certain items that shoppers often buy together are considered the same cart. So when a shopper, especially in a grocery store, buys things, they put milk, eggs, toothpaste, mouse watch, beer, diapers together in their cart, 
they're considered one cart. This is transaction data. This is a special kind of data. We'll read it in as a transaction data set. This goes back to the missingness stuff. So there's two types of things on the test that cover this. And then we would even think of somebody watching things on Netflix as a cart. When you see things on Netflix, when it says like 98% of people who who watch this like it, or they'll be like, you know, it's basically predicting a probability that you'll like something. And Netflix and other people are tuning their algorithms such that they can better predict if you will like something you watch on Netflix. Now, why does Netflix care if you like what you watch? Why does Netflix care that you like what you watch? Why is Netflix always trying to advertise things to you that you have a high likelihood of, of watching and liking? They want you to watch it and they want you to like it. Why does Netflix care about that? Yep, because yep, you might you might cancel your membership because there's other options. It's all, that you stay with Netflix, you got it. So you keep paying. So you're like, man, Netflix just, I mean, wouldn't it be great? You end a show like, let's say you end How I Met Your Mother. I mean, last season, we won't talk about that. And we won't talk about Game of Thrones last season. No spoilers. <laughs> but um, you recommend it to other people. You keep watching. As soon as you end a series of a show, it might say, uh, you might want to watch Two Guys, A Girl, in a Pizza Place. I'm trying to think what else would be like How I Met Your Mother. Um, I can't think of a show that's just like it. I don't know, Seinfeld. I mean, there's no show just like it, obviously. But um, I'm trying to think what else. What would it recommend to you? So this algorithm has to make a choice based on your viewing history. And then it has to look at other people who are like you. And then it has to say, given you've watched these shows, it wants to choose the thing you're most likely to like. Now, it might be like, okay, most people like, uh, uh, is it Everybody Loves Raymond? I don't think I ever liked that show. Make an impression, nobody knows you. <laughs> Is that what their quote is? Nobody knows you better than Netflix. If that's their quote, Jinning right there, 50 points. Um, <laughs> and the Amazon is doing this stuff all the time. They're just making recommendations towards you. It is creepy, right? It is creepy. They really do get to know you. And so the way we market these things really depends on the association. Um, so especially in grocery stores, and this is where this comes into, and I do, I'm starting to think more and more, Friends, How I Met Your Mother would be like Friends, 50 points right there. And then I think that'd be a good recommendation because it's kind of a like young adult sitcom of young adult life. That seems very similar. And I bet the lift between that, because Friends is widely liked and How I Met Your Mother is pretty widely liked. Friends is probably more widely liked. But um, the lift, we'll talk about more about lift again, that if somebody likes How I Met Your Mother, they're probably even more likely to like Friends. Like most people like Friends, like most, what I mean, 60%, I don't know. But if people like How I Met Your Mother, the probability of them liking Friends would be even higher. Does that make sense what I'm saying? If somebody likes How I Met Your Mother, the probability of them liking Friends would be even higher. So then Netflix is going to recommend you Friends. Even though Friends is like a show you might recommend to most people. Like, hey, you should check out Friends. It's a good show. Like most people might say that. You might hate it. That's all right. But if somebody likes How I Met Your Mother with that information, we might recommend Friends to them because it's like, oh, you liked How I Met Your Mother. It's more likely that you'll like Friends. So vice versa too. Exactly. They've got this like synergistic relationship. Exactly. Jordan, 50 points. And so if somebody likes friends, they'd be more likely to like how I met your mother. What if somebody likes, let's choose a, oh, it's like, I don't want to say what's like a bad show. Like what's a show that no one should like? Uh, what was that show? So I'm like, gonna, I'm like, I don't want to insult anybody and be like, what was this show that I, like later seasons of Adventure Time, sorry. I just, Adventure Time just fell off the rails for me. Like early seasons of Adventure Time, I was like, this is awesome. And by the later season, I was like, what is going on with this show? I think it just got too old. But um, there's been a few shows, a few cartoons I just could not get into. Like I, I would watch them and be like, oh, people like this cartoon. And I just, and I actually avoided Rick and Morty for the first, like first two seasons. I got in by the very end of season two and House of Cards, Tiger King, <laughs> Chalk Zone, so I know House of Cards and I know Tiger King. And so like if someone likes Tiger King, what else might they like? And then I don't know what Chalk Zone is. Um, House of Cards, so I can't, I can't comment on it because I don't know. House of Cards, uh, if someone's like House of Cards, what would be a show that someone might like if they like House of Cards? I'm thinking of a like late 90s or mid 90s show. Um, what would be a mid 90s show that someone might like if they like House of Cards? West Wing. Boom, 50 points right there, exactly. So you might be more likely to, or maybe, I don't know, Blacklist. they Or Black Mirror, you might like Twilight Zone. So Grey's Anatomy, um, does there needs to be a zillion seasons. 
and for Grey's Anatomy, it might be like like Scrubs or other things. Like we we ourselves can think of these things. Does that make sense? But the algorithm is not going to go off our intuition. The algorithm is just going to look at the numbers. Does that make sense? Like we're thinking about this, which is good. We're like, okay, if somebody likes, um, what was it called? House of Cards, then they might be more likely to like West Wing. But the algorithm is going to take in the, oh, Rocket Power. There you go. Good cartoons right there. I miss like Doug and Rocco's Modern Life. Those are like the early cartoons of my day. Oh my God, someone's going to be like, those are so old. They're like, no. Rugrats, Rugrats hung around. So what we do with this information this is the business part about it. And I'm going a little, there's my 30 minute warning for meeting. Um, what we do with this information is the hardest part. Like I'm not going to cover these slides too intensely because every decision we make on the information we have is very subjective. Like increase the price of the Barbie doll to give the free candy bar with Walmart can reinforce the buying habits of the particular type of buyer, highest margin of can highest margin candy to be placed near dolls. So they notice that there's an association between people buying this Barbie doll and people buying candy. So they're going to put, and that kind of makes sense. It's like, okay, people who buy Barbie dolls are more likely to buy candy. So let's put the candy we make the most money on near the dolls. So like maybe like the side aisle where the the, the aisles of temptation are, like I've heard that called, I worked in a grocery store. And so you've got, oh, that's the aisle of temptation is the, when you walk through to check out, they put all the like, oh, I need a candy bar. Oh, I need a soda. Like I'm about to leave. Let me grab a cold soda. And it's like, you know, a buck 50 for just a, you know, a soda, um, soda. And so they, it's very strategic. And then the probabilities of you buying it are put in such a way that, you know, they might put candy near these toys. Um, we could argue whether or not that's ethical to put candy near toys, knowing that kids will, you know, go near it and they'd be like, hey, mom, can I get a you know, a doll? And they, oh, it's a candy bar. So it's just, you know, it's the way marketing works. And so that's what they're going to decide. That's what they're going to work with is they're going to work with probabilities here and go off the higher probabilities. Electronic stores did some early examples of association rules. Customers who buy a VHS player tend to come back to the store about three to four months marriage to buy a video camera. So stores send discount coupons for camcorders to all of its customers who bought VHS players, recorders a few months earlier in order to bring these customers back into the store to purchase a camcorder. So the people right here are being marketed to based on the probabilities. The temporal component to association rules can be key. Like how long does it take? When do we notice someone buys this? They're more likely to buy this. So people who buy VHS player or recorders tend to come back and buy camcorders. And so, yeah. So all of a sudden you notice here, you could increase this probability and you could make customers more likely to do this at your store. So you have to watch out because maybe the trend you're noticing is like, yeah, 20% of customers who buy a VHS player buy a, record, buy a camcorder, but then you're not getting the business from the other percent. So you have to figure out what's going on and make great decisions. Um, this is with the hurricane in Florida and it was crazy that we noticed, and I think this is the strawberry pop tarts, right? Yeah. <laughs> the most common. So this is the weirdest part about it. When you think about a hurricane, a hurricane can be something in your basket. So this is what kind of like twisted my mind with this is that a hurricane can be in your basket because what you're saying is, is given there's a hurricane, if you notice, this is all Bayesian, it's all probability based given there's about to be a hurricane, what is more likely to be in someone's basket? Does everyone hear the exact, I want to see some yeses in the chat because this is key phrasing. It's like you have a hurricane in your basket when you're shopping. Does that make like kind of like metaphorical sense that there's a hurricane in your basket when you're shopping? So given there's a hurricane about to occur, so that's metaphorically, Madeline, 50 points right there. Who else? Three more people, 50 points. We see right here, Anisha and Kelsey right there. Yes. So given safety equipment would probably go up too, like medical supplies. And we just saw this with current world events that certain products became more likely to be purchased. So that kind of is a learning experience with things like this. So in the future, we will have a model that predicts this is perfectly applicable to today because if another thing happens like this in the future, we now have information about given there is crazy world event, then these items will increase in the probability of their sales. So next time, six, seven years, hopefully we don't have another crazy world event like this again. But if it does occur again, we have a model that explains and uses probabilities so stores can leverage this. And so stores could leverage the information and say, okay, we saw this in 2020, greatest year ever, haha. 
Um, we saw this in 2020, and now we can leverage that information to you know say the probability of this will go way up. People are going to purchase this way more often, given this is occurring, and it's kind of in the basket of the person when they're shopping. It's I know it sounds weird to say it's in their basket, but it's what they're using as information. And we saw that strawberry pop tarts went way way up in sales. Now I'm a I'm a fan of those cookies and cream pop tarts or s'mores pop tarts. The the chocolate pop tarts, those those are some good stuff. I, I I shouldn't buy them. Like I bought a box of twelve of them and they were gone in like three days. I was like, I'm gonna eat pop tarts for lunch. It's not good life choices. <laughs> so exactly, Madeline, right there, true with that right there, true. I knocked the thing out. Wild blueberry, ooh, wild blueberry is good too. It's like really strong. Brown sugar, I'll, I, I will try some brown sugar pop tarts. That does sound very good to me. I like that right there. I'm always up, man. Some of the pop tarts, cookies and cream, it's all good. Market basket analysis right here. We are getting exactly where I want us to get to. Um, the thought influences their decision. So it's basically like Jordan, it's like it's actually in their basket. So you could actually add a variable. You could literally assign into people's baskets in the data set like a hurricane. You could put, and then your analysis would say like, given there's a hurricane, the probability of someone buying Pop-Tarts would, would be this. So you can actually like assign that to be in people's baskets. So you don't actually have to have physical items people are buying. You can literally add into people's baskets for that time frame a hurricane. Oh yeah, toaster strudel, I gotta say, yeah. A toaster strudel, that's just, you're in a whole different ballpark. That's like, toaster strudels is like the the major leagues. And sorry, Pop-Tarts, you're like, you're like the minor leagues. Like toaster, man. I'm not allowed to buy toaster strudels either because I'll eat those up. Those the apple toaster strudels, those are like those are like apple fritters, man. So the toaster strudels. <laughs> okay. So a little bit more to cover today. And think about this. Given somebody buys Pop Tarts, they're more likely to buy toaster strudels, maybe. Maybe your your grocery store has a better margin on toaster strudels. And so you could send them a coupon for toaster strudels. You might still get their Pop Tart money. But um, people who buy Pop-Tarts might be more likely to buy toaster strudels. If you have a better margin on toaster strudels, maybe you can get them to start buying those. So maybe you could switch someone over. So you might say, we can maybe get them to buy both by sending them this coupon. And maybe the coupon's good enough that we still get a, the margin better on the toaster strudels. So this is literally the business side of analytics. Like I'd have to know the numbers. I'd have to know your margins. And then we'd have to see that there's an association between buying Pop-Tarts and buying toaster strudels. And then we would then make choices based on this to say, okay, we can reinforce this habit, get people to buy toaster strudels. And some people are gonna buy toaster strudels and Pop-Tarts, but if someone switches from the two, which we know is possible, because maybe we'll see what happens given we send someone a coupon because you could then put that in the basket like given someone has a coupon how does that influence their behavior of buying both of them or neither or one so you can look you could start putting that in people's baskets like this person was sent a coupon and the next time they went to the store they did this habit it gets so complex this is why people get paid tons of money to analyze this type of data i mean it's it's all consumer behavior and it's all being done with associations it's i don't know i, th I don't know if it'd be fun or not like i'm just like i I'd hate to like make a decision and the company be like, your decision was wrong and you lost us a million dollars. And I'd be like, oh, or they'd be like, you got us $20 million. I'd be like, yay. And they're like, uh, and here's your $5 raise. <laughs> I'd be like, what? I just made you $20 million. Cause I, I figured out we should send people a coupon for toaster strudels. <laughs> they'd be like, yeah, that was obvious. I'd be like, well, you weren't doing it. <laughs> okay. So our grocery store has in it 10,000, 10,000 products. So with our 10,000 products right here, how many combinations are there? This is where it gets insane. Because if you were to look at the way in which people could buy two products, it'd be almost 50 million. The way in which people could buy three products, it's almost 166 million. The way in which people can buy four products, this is four, yep, four products is, that's million, billion, trillion. You know, a little under a half a quadrillion ways. So. This is where, and this is a very important thing for the assignment, the choose 1,000 out of K. So what does this code do right here? This is in your assignment coming up. This chooses um, from 1,000 items, the number of K combinations that exist. And here we'll show it off real quick in the notes right here. This is notes later. If we go to choose, let's go to choose from three items, one. How many ways, if there's three items in your grocery store, how many ways can you choose one item? If this is a grocery store with three items, how many ways can you choose one item? This is an item with three grocery stores. We have bread, water, and milk. 
you only get to buy one. How many ways can you choose one of them? Three ways. Three ways. Yep. Now I'm going to let you choose three items in my grocery store. How many ways can you choose three items? Like how many different combinations of ways can you choose three items for my three items in my grocery store? So I got bread, water, milk. How many ways? Just one. Nitten right there, 50 points. Just one. Everyone gets 20 points. Nitten gets 50. Just one way. It gets more complicated when you get to things like I have 10 items in my grocery store and you can pick none of them. How many ways can you pick none item, none of the items out of my 10, 10 item grocery store? I have 10 items in my grocery store and you get to pick none of them. Yep, you're saying one. That's the answer. It's only one way to buy none of the items. How about if you buy 10 of the items in my 10 item grocery store? So you get to buy 10 items in my 10 item grocery store. One way. How about, now this one's pretty easy. And I, I could, these, this could be on the test. How many ways can you buy nine items in my 10 item grocery store? And this is a good way to think about this code. 100 points first person. How many ways? 10 ways, knit and boom, boom. 10 ways. Because you're basically not buying one of the items. So to buy nine items, it's like you buy every item but one. This would be the same. These actually make those, um, what are they called? Like uh, golden triangle type things. So um, the like it, it creates the, thing that goes like this if you know what it's called is it called pascal's golden triangle maybe maybe if you notice there's symmetry to this like these answers will be symmetric Nitin, you got to help us out here you got to tell us what it is i think it's pascal's golden triangle maybe but there's the symmetry of this and then this one right here so i might just need to google it but um someone will 100 points first person in the chat pascal's triangle yeah it's pascal's triangle so we see these sorts of relationships, 100 points in right there. Excellent work. That's Pascal's triangle at work for us right there. It's And it's so cool to me how like, um, once again, I'm not the best in mathematics. And, um, but I do, what does the 10 and the five mean in the positions? This right here is the number of items you have in your grocery store. So this is a, we have a 1000 item grocery store or it could be like 1000 movies on Netflix. And then this right here is the combinations by which we're picking. So you're saying there's 1,000 movies on Netflix. How many ways could you watch K movies? So you could do Netflix with it. Like Netflix has one, uh, that's 1,000, that's 10,000. Netflix has 10,000 movies. How many ways could you watch four movies on Netflix? So if we go right back to here, sorry, we're switching a lot. But Netflix has 10,000 movies. So Netflix has 10,000 movies. How many ways could you watch four movies? Yeah, there's a lot of ways you could watch four movies on Netflix with Netflix having 10 thousand movies so this will get us to our very last topic of today we're switching a lot sorry about that um but does that make sense what this code is doing does everyone understand a hundred percent that this is finding the combinations of the items we have which is the first number and the ways in which we can pick those items like the unique combinations so it's the unique combinations and it, it doesn't care about order because it's not saying like you'd watch this movie, then this movie, then this movie. It's finding like how many different combinations are there of like four different movies, like Donnie Darko, Eternal Sunshine, Deadpool, and um, and Spider Verse. There you go. You got some good movies to watch now. But it's not going to care about the order in which you watch them. It's saying how many ways out of the ten thousand movies on Netflix could you watch four different movies? And it doesn't care what order you watch them in because we don't care the order people put the items into their basket. We care about analyzing what's in their basket. So we're going to come back to this slide we talked about before, but I just want to mention why we do this. And we'll talk about the mathematics next class. So once again, we're going to come back. We'll finish this next class, but I want to mention why we're doing this. If you notice that slide that said like we had like 500 quadrillion combinations of things that could occur. The issue we have is that if we were to analyze every single combination, you can see the, the Pascal's triangle going here with the different combinations of things that can occur. And you can see it building up in the middle. In our example, you would see this thing that would just get so huge. So what we do with the a priori learning method, and I've got like two minutes to just tell you what this is. The a priori learning method eliminates certain combinations to have us only focus in on things that maybe occur a certain amount of the time. So if combination AB does not occur a certain amount of times, everything with AB in it is eliminated because people only buy... Uh, let's say this is uh, Grey Poupon and Mustard together 10% of the time, then this would be someone who buys Grey Poupon, Mustard, and Ketchup. So if people only buy this 10% of the time, people would only buy this in an additional item what percent of the time? Either that amount or what? This is my last question of the day, 100 points. 
people who buy grape upon and mustard 10% of the time, it would either, yep, it'd have to be 10% or less. Does that make sense? Like if you buy A and B together 10% of the time, people could only buy A, B, and C together 10% or less because it would have to be everyone who buys grape upon and mustard would also have to buy ketchup and then it would be 10% of people buy that. But you can't get more people buying A, B, and C than you have people buying A and B. Does that make sense right here? Because if we're going to say A and B do not occur enough together, then everything with A and B down below is eliminated. So if it has A, B, then we wouldn't have enough people buying that. So you could literally say D does not occur enough. And by eliminating D, look at all the combinations you would eliminate. You'd eliminate with everything with D below this. So if you say D is only bought by 1% of our customers, well, let's not focus in on D. And this is the a priori learning method. So I, this is it. That's the end of class. So no new stuff. When class, when time ends, material ends. But I can comment on this a little bit more. Um, I'm, I'm traveling to Kingsport. Uh, is there, we have an assignment due, right? I'll, I should, I'll do office hours. I might send out an announcement. I'll do office hours. I need to do it. I got you guys. I know you guys are working hard. We got this. And I'll travel to Kingsport more towards the evening. So we'll do this. We will do this. We got this. Because I, I would do them after class. But then meetings. Meetings. Um, but no, I got you guys. We got some office hours. You got it. Hop in. It'll probably be around 3-ish. So expect around 3. You guys got it. No, I really appreciate you guys. I know you guys are working super hard. I know Sumper's summer suppers <laughs> i want to say i want to say to my mom like buy some i've got a taco box and i want to like say to her i want to be like hey can you get some like ground beef from the grocery store maybe some onions we can make some tacos like that'd be awesome and tomatoes like i like tomatoes is one of those things i just like if you cut them really small and you put them in tacos it's like it's like a salsa so you know what i really like i like pico de gallo like pico de gallo that is i haven't had pico de gallo in a while it was let's say 300 Taco party, man. Tacos are awesome. I need like, I'll just, I'll just. Chelsea, I want to say it's Taco Tuesday. Taco Tuesday. Pico de Gallo is the best. Like, I think it's got a little bit of, like lime or lemon in it. Like, um, oh, it's got cilantro in it too, and guac. Guacamole is great, excellent too. It's, it's really good. We in Kingsport, there's what is it, uh, La Coretta in Kingsport, but here in here in Knoxville, we got soccer taco. Yeah, soccer taco is the best. I'm just, I'm going out and saying it. Soccer taco, soccer taco. So if you guys go out and you want some really good Mexican food, soccer taco is really good. There is, a, there's a lot of other places. Like someone might say soccer taco is not the most authentic, but I, just, I love soccer taco. I don't know if anyone else here loves soccer. Sylvia's, Sylvia's really good. Isn't that, that's the place in your Publix, right? I haven't tried uh, Sylvia yet. Didn't like some soccer taco. Soccer taco is so good, man. Shivo, yeah, Shivo's really good. Is Shivo back open? Um, a few of my students have worked at Shivo. Um, yeah, she, she, Chivo, I don't know how to say it exactly. Um, how you say it? El Girasol, El Girasol, and Girasol, is that something of the sun? El Girasol is really great and really authentic. Okay, so now I need to check out El Girasol before I leave. I need Chelsea here to check it out. Downtown Gay Street is the, is Chivo. Where's, where's El Girasol at? Um, where is that at? Because that sounds really good and it's authentic. Because I would probably say it means sunflower. There we go. Oh, so gira is flower, flower of the sun. El gira sol. So um, that sounds so good now. Dang it. <laughs> I need to like, I need to say to Chelsea, I'll be like, okay, you should fly to Knoxville and then fly back to Texas. <laughs> it's right across from Kroger by Elmez right there. Awesome. So check out El gira sol. That sounds really good right there. It's reasonably priced too. Yeah, a lot of places are. Like, um, no, I really. I think, like, since I live so close to downtown, Soccer Taco, we can walk there, like, Chelsea and I would walk there in, like, 10 minutes. It's so funny. We'd see, like, students. They'd be like, hey. They're like, hey. Because, <laughs> like, just walking to Soccer Taco. And, you know, Soccer Taco is really good. Everything. Good. Yeah. <laughs> but Soccer Taco, and they're so nice. Like, we we definitely, we, we went there, like, every week for, like, a year, year and a half. So we'd have our Soccer Taco, like, Fridays. And, um Really nice place. Just really love it and love the patio. So I miss Soccer Taco, obviously. But then there's a lot of other great places. Oh, Neeland. I didn't even see you in the chat, Neeland. Neeland, awesome. Thank you. I hope you're still here, Neeland. And it's so good to see you in the chat saying, hey, smash and like on that right there. We're finishing up. It's so good to have you. We're just talking food. I think I'm so hungry. That's why I'm just like talking food. Does anyone else have any other restaurant suggestions before I hop off here and go to the meeting? I got my water. That's all I can get is water. 
You know what? Stock and Barrel. Stock and Barrel is excellent in downtown. If you want a really good burger, a little more expensive. I mean, you know, if you want your, what is that? Kizan? Oh, is that is that the place? Is that walking to downtown? Is that the um, is that the Japanese place? I think it's Japanese. That's um, right near um, uh, an office hours will be around three today. I have meetings coming up here in literally at eleven thirty, so we're just chilling for a moment. I guess I could answer a quick question if you have it. Like, um, yeah, don't they have like ramen? Do they have ramen bowls? We Chelsea and I went to a ramen place and I thought it was good, but like, it was good. Like I was like, this is good. It was it was in uh, Oakland. We went to a ramen place. Cafe Four has some. Yeah, Cafe Four is really great. Cafe Four, they've got a good burger there too. Like, so not in Texas yet. Nope. So good to see you here, Neiland. I'll be in Texas uh, July like third or so. Start of July. I'll be there for the Fourth of July. So it'll be really fun. I, I think I'll be in Texas for the Fourth of July. I think I will be. It. I'll be traveling. Either I'll be traveling. It's 4th of July is like on a Saturday or something like that. And we end, we end class and then I'll be like getting grades together. We end class on a Wednesday. So the final will probably go to like Thursday morning and then I'll get grades done on like Thursday, probably be packing Thursday and maybe leave Friday or Saturday. I just got to make sure I get enough sleep because it's like a 14, 15 hour drive. So I'll literally be like finishing class, packing my car, getting ready to go and driving, traveling down to Texas. It's pretty, pretty, pretty busy, pretty, I mean... I'm so excited and I just, it's the only, the big barrier is like the 14 hour drive. I just hate that. It'll be sweet. I know. And then, um, what's really exciting is I'm just excited for setting up the studio and stuff and setting up my new place with Chelsea. Um, because you know, like I'm just, uh, it's just, I don't know. I've been in the same spot for 11 years. And so now it's like, okay, this is our place. And so that's really, you know, like, you know, we get to have our own apartment. And we get to like, I don't know, build it up the way we want it. So I'm really excited. I don't know. I just, it's so crazy to me. It's, you know, in like uh, three weeks or so. It'll be three weeks from today. Holy mackerel. You got to be kidding me. Is that right? One, two, three. Ha <laughs> ha. It's three weeks from today. <laughs> uh, my fiance is a resident in uh, anesthesia. She is a veterinary resident. She's, she's, I keep saying she's the smart one. Um, on question Q5, 3 for 320, there are vertical brackets around the R. Um, what does this mean? R, the absolute value of R, the correlation is 0.7. Oh, okay. So that means the absolute value of R. So when you do the correlation, here, let's hop over here. Let's see. I think it's should have The absolute value of the correlation. And good, this is saved for today. Do I have this one open? Please don't have it open. Da, 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 da. Is this it right here? Good. Um, awesome, Neilan. So good to have you, Neilan. Swing by any time. Swing by any time. The... Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Um, generate a scatter plot right here, such that the absolute value of the correlation. And so when you knit this, which we might be able to knit it, um, I knit to HTML just so I can view it. It's the quickest way to knit. Um, so when you knit this right here, we should see... Uh, what it displays. And once again, you won't turn these in. But if you notice right here, so that the absolute value of R, so that's saying that you need a correlation that um, is like, it, it could be positive 0.7 or negative 0.7, but then plus or minus this right here. Where and why do we need to use this in 474 homework? Um, I think do it at the start of it. Um, because one of the sanity checks turns out different. Um, you're Yeah, you're okay with using images. I'm cool with that. I mean, if you choose the right image, you're good. It's, yeah, I want that to be pretty easy. Um, and so if you put that at the start of your, if you put that at the start of it, it'll be good. So you could put that, this is the wrong assignment for it. But if you put this right here, it'll set the, and I think that's the right one. Here's the function I made. This is, oh, cool. Um, is this fine or do I need to write a description on what A and B mean? Let me see. Okay, so strongest, oh, cool. Oh, man. Yeah, good job on this. Um, that's just fun we were having yesterday. I got, got like two more minutes. Here we go. Oh, nice job. I did something like this. I literally wrote something just like this. Like this, this, this makes me so happy because when you join the two lists, nice. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. 
Yeah, and then you printed it out right there and you printed the two lists and you print it right there. And you could, you could change this to a cat right here. And um, if you do cat, it won't make it appear as an item. So now when you cat it, um, it'll appear like this. Oof, you see we got a problem then. So you wanna do cat paste, go cat paste. So you see this is when, you know, let's go look at your code's doing. So which add was perfect. Don't don't make the changes here I'm making. Um, backslash n. And now well, let's see what this does. That's gonna print the other one crazy. Like, ah, I broke it, I broke it, I broke it. Don't do what I do, I broke it. It's perfectly fine, paste is fine, paste is fine. And then, okay. So uh, we're the code's severely broken right now. There we go, now we can fix it. Um, there's the top five strongest, top five Pearson, and that's awesome. It's being sorted via magnitude, right? Yep. Uh, you've done it. This is, this has got it. Amazing. Uh, Alex, that is amazing. Um, is there a way to load the data of A in a function? So you're trying to load the data of EX2 census in the function? Um, I have to expand upon that and I've got like 30 seconds. Um, you're trying to load this right here. And then your B is where you're choosing the, the, um, the interest. Yeah. So you've got the interest right here of B. I don't, I don't think I get the question. I'll be on during officers though. So if the data isn't loaded in the global environment, the function will do it for you now. Um, so you probably... You probably wouldn't want to do that because you're going to let someone choose it. And I like your function a lot. I'm throwing you an extra 100 points right now. I like your function a lot because it gets you the two strongest correlations right here. And I should send you, send me an email and say, send me that top five function, Brian. Oh, this is the bonus, isn't it? Yeah, this is the bonus because I did it too. I, I forgot to put the bonus on here. Um, that asked you to get the top five. This is 100% it. You've done it. You've made a function that gets you the top five. This is totally it. Congratulations. This is excellent, excellent work right here. Um, this is definitely a way to do it. And and I mean that in a very good way. Like this is a very, and I like the printout right here. This is very acceptable. And then someone could put in any, any data frame they want. Like you could go here to survey 10. And so you go to survey 10 and you put in like weight. And then there you go. There's the top five for survey 10 weight with Pearson and Spearman. And there's the strongest Pearson. Yeah, no, this is excellent. This is exactly it. And this is the goal of statistics is like, Someone can run this function right now and strongest correlation and they can get the Pearson Spearman just like that instantaneously. Well, that's got it. I got a meeting. So I will see everybody. Alex, excellent work. Keep it up. Keep, keep coding away. Impressive work. I'll see everybody at three. Bye.